and welcome to QI, the quiz show where the answers are much more interesting than the questions, but the questions are completely impossible. Uh, as I don't really expect anyone to get any of them right, I shall be awarding points for being interesting along the way, regardless of whether the panel's answers are correct or even relevant. So let, <laughs> let's just meet the panel who want to commit intellectual suicide tonight, and they are <laughs> Danny Baker, <laughs> John Sessions, <laughs> Hugh Laurie, Davis. Now, each of our employees, I can't really be doing with the word guests, each of our employees here tonight <laughs> has a buzzer in the time-honoured tradition. Danny goes, <coughs> John goes, <coughs> Hugh goes, <coughs> Alan goes, to Belgium, for which I profusely <laughs> apologise. Well, we've got a lot, to, a lot to do, so let's get on with it. And we're better to start than right at the beginning mm -hmm. with a round of questions on Adam and Eve. Whether or not you believe in them, they are quite interesting, which is all we ask on this programme. Like God, as Woody Allen said, how can I believe in God when just last week I got my tongue caught in the roller of an electric typewriter? <laughs> Carrie Snow, the American comedian, said, if God was a woman, Sperm would taste of chocolate. But, um, <laughs> perhaps... <laughs> I don't understand it either. Perhaps we... As you know, it doesn't. It... <laughs> <laughs> oh, he knows. <laughs> Damn. Um, but perhaps, you know, we should believe in Adam and Eve. Um, geneticists have established <laughs> that every woman in the world shares a single female ancestor who lived 150,000 years ago. Scientists do actually call her Eve, and every man shares a single male ancestor dubbed Adam. It's also been established, however, that Adam was born 80,000 years after Eve. So the world before him was one of heavy to industrial strength lesbianism, I'm <laughs> um, Now, the first question goes to Alan. What is the connection between the Archbishop of Canterbury's left ear oh. and Adam's belly button? His ear, the ear and the belly... God, just as you said that, there was a painting came up. It, we do this, I'm afraid, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bit, I'm not going to ask uh, uh, who did the painting. That would be an insult. Adam's on the left. Yes, well done. That's his belly button there. It would seem. And it, the Archbishop of Canterbury's ear... Yeah. <laughs> the only time I can ever think where you'd put your ear to someone's belly button would be to hear if their tummy was rumbling. Yes. You go, your tummy's rumbling, you're hungry, aren't you? <laughs> True. Is that, is that what it is? I'm afraid... It... <laughs> I don't want to astonish you, but I'm afraid it isn't. Is it because well, Adam wouldn't have had a belly button, would he, being the first man, and neither would he have had a belly button? Is good. that right? You're really you're good. So, you're, I'm, <laughs> yeah, he is good, isn't he? I'm going to give him yeah. uh, three points for that. The, the, the fact is they're both purely really... decorative. Adam, oh. of course, cannot have had. A navel because he was created. Oh. He wasn't born, mm -hmm. so there wouldn't have been umbilical cord. Yeah. You're saying the Archbishop of Canterbury's left ear is purely, purely decorative. He describes it himself. <laughs> <laughs> he was born deaf in the left ear, so it has no. Right, no function. If his left ear is purely decorative, yes. it's very unimaginative for him just to have an ear there. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he really could have had anything he wanted there at all. He's a, a gift donut like or, or another or another organ a like a hand. Racket, I would have said. A road sign, yeah. <laughs> a little chicklet. Or rather sort of surreal, a portrait of Van Gogh. Uh -huh. Yeah, he could have had Van Gogh. Uh -huh. See, that's brilliant. Was missing. Yeah. He'd have a little Van Gogh there, yeah. saying, mm. as if to say, do you see? Mm. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, we've got something out of the wreckage. I, I'm really <laughs> Who uh, painted that picture? 1475 till 1564. I hate myself for saying that. Who really? Those are his dates. He's quite correct. No, 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 so no, Michelangelo that, that... Buonarroti. We have to give um, five points to Johnny Sessions for oh. knowing the birth and oh, death right. dates of That's Michelangelo. So yeah, 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 yeah. We also have to hate him, incidentally. Yes. <laughs> Very impressive. No. You can do this. I've done this with John Sessions at parties. When was Bruckner born? 1824, died 1896. You see? It's weird, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Marla. 1860, born July the 7th in Caliste in Austria. <laughs> by 1911 in Caliste in Austria. It's a horrible thing. I met a man the other day who said he was a naval doctor. I didn't know they specialised that much. <laughs> <laughs> According to Rita Mae Brown, if Michelangelo had been heterosexual, the Sistine Chapel would have been painted basic white and with a roller. <laughs> 
ask you a question now. After the flood, God gave Noah the right to do what? To sheep. A right, <laughs> a right which he denied to Adam. Well, what do we know about Adam? We know Adam um, uh, was forbidden the forbidden fruit, so it's not that. It wasn't the forbidden sheep, was it? I know that much about Sunday school. <laughs> uh, to, to keep them, to mate, to farm them, to... Well, it could, he could not eat them. He could not as eat simple, them. As that? As yeah. simple as that. It doesn't make any sense, because Adam, <laughs> there would have been probably a lot of sheep, but Noah's down to the last two sheep. <laughs> and God said, it's all right, if you fancy it. <laughs> you bad. Have well, one on me. And Noah said, Alan, I'm not going to eat the sheep, God, you're out of your mind. No, eat them is the right answer, because according to the Bible, Adam and Eve were vegetarians told by God to eat fruit and vegetables only. Some theological authorities believe that the forbidden fruit which is not specifically named in the Bible, uh, which was eaten by Adam and Eve, was in fact a banana. It was only after the great flood when God made a new covenant with Noah and he said, every living thing that moves will be yours to eat. And somehow we got from there to Bernard Matthews' golden turkey drummers. <laughs> Here's more than anyone can answer. Fingers on buzzers. Of whom was it said, working with her was like being hit over the head with a Valentine card? Anne Whittacombe. Not Anne Whittacombe. <laughs> no, it's not her. It, in fact, it was Christopher Plummer on the subject oh. of Julie Andrews. Oh, wow. And this brings us to a round about Andrews. People <laughs> called Andrew or Andrews. John, the painter Caravaggio yes. was once arrested for throwing artichokes at a waiter. The art historian Andrew Graham Dixon discovered something about Caravaggio's outrageous behaviour on the tennis court. What was it? Something similar about Caravaggio. He died in 1610, but that now he's <laughs> now a finger sits in 10. And of course, and he committed murder. And, 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 uh, but in fact, Andrew's programme. Oh, yes. But not that we should be talking about other programmes, that's far too incestuous. Well, this is what the question is about, is about Andrew Graham Dixon, the yes. artist who made a programme about Caravaggio. Sorting out why, in fact, Caravaggio died prematurely and was possibly murdered by those avenging him for the death of Thomasino, I think, was the artist who he, yes. he had the fight with. Um, for those of you who didn't watch that's it, good. stay with us. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I'll give you five points, but I'll, um, yes. anybody else know the answer to this, what, what no. Caravaggio did on a tennis court? On court? a tennis court. He said, enough Certainly. with the square balls, why don't we use my <laughs> round? <laughs> well, these are all I good mean, answers, I'll have to tell you. beaten by a British player, that's yeah. what I still talk about. <laughs> 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 <Excellent. laughs> For almost 400 years, um, historians have believed that Caravaggio was uh, exclusively homosexual, and they believed that he murdered a man mm. called Ranuccio uh, Tomassoni in a squabble Sorry, over a tennis so. match. Uh, but it's now thought, thanks to the <laughs> pioneering work of Andrew Graham Dixon, <laughs> that Thomas Sony's death was an accident and Caravaggio was only trying to cut off his testicles, not oh. to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Yes. Over a gate. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> New balls, please. <laughs> oh! It's um, minus ten points. Oh, I mean, didn't even know who he is. Caravaggio. <laughs> oh, thank God you said that. <laughs> See, to my mind, that's not interesting enough. I was hanging in. Oh no, Caravaggio is very interesting. You would find him. He was the really, perhaps one I know of the something greatest about castration. I knew that's a <laughs> Tell me about and castration. And it's to do with this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> When they castrate the sheep, they do it without breaking the skin of the scrotum. Yes. Yes. No, yes. Done it. And, <laughs> and, and, and the testicles just fall into the ball sack, and then they do the kind of great sultana thing. They become they little They drop off. They wither, don't they? They do wither, yeah. yeah. Mm. Use a little elastic band, don't you? You use a little tiny uh, elastic... I've got one on at the moment. Mm. <laughs> That's <interesting. Yeah. laughs> the Prince Albert. <laughs> yeah. Prince Albert, now there's a story, isn't it? Really? Yes, yes. Um, he and Victoria, they had masses of sex. I mean, they had nine children, and they probably had sex maybe a hundred times a night for years and years and years. <laughs> Until he died. Stopped yes. after he died. But, yes. um, is that why the Albert Memorial is a great big tall... Precisely. <laughs> I did a, a, a charity count. show in the um, in the heyday of the Spice Girls, and uh, there was a lineup <laughs> afterwards with uh, with the Prince of Wales. I was there. Were you there? You were that one. Do you remember? And they asked him um, whether or not Prince Albert yeah. actually did wear a Prince Albert. No, and he and said. Prince Wales said, "I have no idea what, what a Prince Albert is." <laughs> so I, I had to explain to him that it wasn't. An did item. you tell him? I didn't say it was a cock ring. I said. <laughs> Did you use I it? said it was a piece of jewellery worn in an, in an intimate area. Oh, yeah. I said. He would have said, oh, a cock ring! <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Let's turn ourselves back to Caravaggio and Tomasini, if we can. Yeah. The two men were rivals for the favours of Filide Melandroni, a beautiful female prostitute for whom Tomasini acted as pimp. Caravaggio had been commissioned to paint her for an Italian nobleman. For an extra five points, can you connect this... Oh. I will pass it round if you need to handle <laughs> it or smell it. Fennel. ..with Italian homosexuals. Oh. <laughs> Are there any Italian homosexuals in the room? My dressing number is 315. <laughs> it is fennel. I will tell you that, yes. Um, is the uh, street slang for homosexual sex? Yes, correct. Wow. Ten points. Yes. Oh, look at that. You will get um, yeah. Yeah. But what is it, though? Because there's a certain <laughs> word. Pinocchio, which is, which is fennel in Italian. Like Pinocchio, but with an F. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It is. Yes, it's it's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Good. 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 Now, Hugh, still with Andrews, according to Andrew Marshall's recent book about Burma, a Burmese may well sidle up to you and murmur, Excuse me, sir, but I see that your department store is open even on weekends. <laughs> what does he mean by that? What's the game? <laughs> well, it's either it's just too much Len Dayton. I've been reading too many Len Dayton novels. It means the merchandise, the, you know, the microfilm is under the seat. Or <laughs> it's your flies are open or something. Ten it's points, a... your flies are undone is exactly oh, really? wow. what I mean. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> Appropriate oh. enough, uh, this book uh, on, on Burma is called The Trouser People. To give you a foretaste, it quotes the diary of Sir George Scott, the man who introduced football to Burma in the 19th century. Stepped on something soft and wobbly, struck a match, found it was a dead Chinaman. <laughs> <laughs> Those very much were the days, weren't they? Um, you wonder why the British are hated around the globe. Um, <laughs> the upstairs ready my angel, of course, was Burma. Burma. B-U-R-M-A, mm -hmm. Alan Bennett's and, and, and not love as well, Nick is off ready when I, when come, I come home. home. That's yeah. Norwich. Norwich, I mean, yes. that's... that's <laughs> 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 oh, yes, that's <laughs> right. Oh, it doesn't matter. That's Bolton. <laughs> 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 yes, Norwich. It's clinically insane. So, uh, actually, interesting, while well, double checking this information yeah. about etiquette uh, and Burma on the internet, we came up with the extraordinary uh, information that it's considered polite to express joy by eating snow and to send unwanted guests away by biting their leg and normal behaviour <laughs> to wipe your mouth on the sofa. Um, <laughs> this is absolutely true. The, the researchers writing this down with great excitement about what Burma, yeah. only to discover in the end that Burma turned out to be the name of a poodle belonging to the author of the website. <laughs> Now, this third round is about actors. After weeks of being pointedly ignored on tour by Sir John Gilgood, Clive Morton, the character actor, plucked up the courage to knock on his dressing room door. Gilgood opened it. Thank God it's you, he said. For one dreadful moment, I thought it was going to be that ghastly bore, Clive Morton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, why... <laughs> Hugh. Yes? Why does the actor Edward Woodward have four Ds in his name? What? What? No, what are you I'm doing? Sorry. <laughs> What are you doing? I'm sorry. It was a spasm. You no. can't do that. You can't do that. I'll put it out. <laughs> Just carry on. Do you know, this Forget is I'm quite here. interesting. Yes, good. That's what we're here for. <laughs> yes, you know. Very good. Kiwi fruit uses more than its own weight in aviation fuel to get from New Zealand to Europe. <laughs> Five points. Wonderful. Another five points. It sounds mad, but is it, of course, true, absolutely. And regarding the Edward Woodward... Yes. That's how you spell it. Oh, no, no, you can... Of course you. No, you know, really, that's fine. <laughs> I was going to say exactly that, that it's got that many Ds in it, because that's his name. <laughs> if you took the Ds out, it would be a different name. And what e name would it be? Ah. It would be e exactly. It would be e wah woo woo e wah woo woo <laughs> It's a sort of structural device, like a, like a joist, which, which stops his name collapsing into the sort of spongy mass of Iwa Woo Woo. You, you were mentioning Edward Woodward, and you, before that, you mentioned John Gilgood. And John Gilgood, when he first heard the name Edward Woodward, said, This is an interesting name, and it sounds like a fart in the bath. <laughs> it does. Very good. 
Yeah, yeah, you're probably not but I mean, yeah. you get your points, so you naturally. Um, now, let's, let's go back to our actors' round. Which actor said, one of my chief regrets during my years in the theatre is that I couldn't sit in the audience and watch me? Oh, God, any of them. <laughs> Well, actually, now, hold on, because I think actors do a bloody difficult job. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's quite easy to sit there and, you know, sort of... Fall asleep. <laughs> John Gilgood, I reckon. Yes. No, it's not, actually. There is a very good story, though, about Peter O'Toole, who was once getting drunk in his Celtic Hellraiser days in a pub in London, and uh, they were throwing out time at lunchtime. He said, let's go and see a play. And, and um, at one point, O'Toole nudged his friend and said, this is brilliant. This is a bit where I come on. Oh, bollocks! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in fact, um, uh, uh, <laughs> is the answer. It wasn't any of those. It was another great, uh, considered the great Hamlet of his age, if you're an American, uh, John Barrymore, it was. Oh, right. uh, Barrymore also famously said, love is the delightful interval between meeting a beautiful girl and discovering that she looks like a haddock. <laughs> Right, bearing in mind we want to be in the bar before half past ten. <laughs> Fingers on the buzzers, please, gentlemen, and identify the following. They puff out their hair like a cat, raise one front foot, and then hop menacingly from side to side, roaring with all the fury of a clogged drain. <laughs> yes. It's either cats <laughs> or clogged drains. One of the other. It's actually anteaters. Oh! Anteaters. Right. Part of the elaborate play sequences of young giant anteaters, in fact, which is known as bluff charging. Oh. And we're going to have a few questions about anteaters. Mm. We're going to start with you, Alan. Oh! Mm. What would you do with a pencil and a lesser anteater? Oh, uh, hours of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably try and make it pick it up with its nose. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it really got a good grip on it, I'd encourage it to do a sketch or a note. <laughs> I'd say anything that's on your mind, get it down now. <laughs> it could go for 35 miles, which is how long an average graphite pencil will, if you just go like that, all the way till there's nothing left. This man's extraordinary. Oh, it's it's another five points. It's it's miles. It is. He knows how many yeah. miles a graphite pencil Yes, he does. Two pencils, 35 miles. However, with an ant eater. Uh, yeah. I mean, now I'm, I can't get any, out of my head the, uh, the notion of inserting the pencil somewhere. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> yeah. and, and then there being a release of hundreds of ants. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what it is. Uh, uh, Anteaters have enormously long tongues, <laughs> but tiny little mouths, which are about the diameter uh, of a pencil. Its tongue is around 16 inches long. I nearly had my face off there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this way. Actually, anyway. yeah, not that way. <laughs> I knew a landlord of a pub once. He used to say to any female customer that he liked the look of, I've got a nine-inch tongue and I can breathe through my ears. <laughs> <laughs> now... <laughs> Good. That's, the, that's the longest sustained laugh I've ever had. <laughs> no, never went very high, but just went, oh. <laughs> A bit like the graphite pencil. <laughs> 35 mile laugh. <laughs> John, your question. Would you like to be hugged <laughs> by a giant anteater? Um, probably not. Um, I would probably be eviscerated. Quite right. <laughs> the anteaters, um, ha have, in order to claw open a termite hill, I'm sorry, I'm getting very dull now, yeah. the Attenborough does it so much better, but they have curly fingers, like that, only the metal, and they pull it apart. Uh, once it is pulled apart, as it were, like a, like a rather interesting pie, then they can get the tongue in that yes. Alan's Good. friend in the pub was talking <laughs> about, so it's really good. And, um, and I think I've answered the question. <laughs> Absolutely right, yes, yes. A hug from a giant anteater is fatal to humans, partly because mm. of uh, 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 the fact that giant anteaters are also known as ant bears for that reason, because their hug is so fatal. Oh. They're normally... They squash you. That, they squash you. That's, 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 yeah, they, they break your, your, your ribs and... Um, have they been known to attack humans? Human. Except for seeing yes, by an anteater. No, no, in in defence, they're normally very Come easygoing. Going, John, and then go, oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> what the dates are not any harm? <laughs> <laughs> Hugh, how big is a dwarf anteater? Roughly. You can use your hands. <laughs> Metric or imperial? Um, <laughs> a dwarf anteater is exactly the same length as a dwarf ant eater. 
<laughs> ah. uh, both of the both species are 62 feet. <laughs> Actually, uh, they're about the size of a squirrel. Right, a 62 foot squirrel. Yes. Is a, is a, <laughs> no, that's that sort of size. Well, they are, and they're similar to squirrels because they spend a lot of time uh, in trees. Uh, and uh, in South America, stewed anteater uh, of this variety, the dwarf anteater, is a popular dish. Mm. Fried or grilled baby squirrels are popular in the United States. Yeah. But as someone pointed out in a letter to the Telegraph, <laughs> the, the, the fried or, or, or grilled uh, squirrel should contain a warning, may contain nuts. Which, uh, <laughs> which I thought was lovely. Uh, sorry. Oh, now, there's just time for a quick last round, uh, which is an assortment called General Ignorance. Fingers on the buzzers, please, <laughs> for this quick-fire round. <laughs> ten points for a right answer, but minus ten Ooh. for anything which I have oh, written no. down here. Right. All righty. So, which country has the world's highest suicide rate? <laughs> yes. Woof! <laughs> Sweden, isn't it? Oh, you're so yeah. <laughs> you always Sweden. It's one of those urban mythy things, isn't is it? it? Yeah. It's no. not Sweden. Another one but I read somewhere is, is that a, <clears throat> a ship's captain cannot marry people. No. Yes, never been true. I'd, I've heard that, and it's true. It's invented by screenwriters. Yeah. Exactly, and well. lemmings don't jump over cliffs, do they? They, were, do they, they yeah. exactly. heard it together for that Disney film in 1964, <laughs> White Winter. Yeah. So Disney yeah. rounded out all these lemmings and drove Land Rovers at them. <laughs> <laughs> we've, all seen, we've all seen that footage of them going over the cliffs, but they don't do that. Really? They never do. Yeah. Got to be five for being interesting about lemmings. This man is just a runaway interest. <laughs> Suicide answer. I think. I don't know why, but. Did somebody say Indonesia to me once? That it they was didn't. Right? Not currently, as far as we know, is it the correct answer? No. Neither. Um, mm. It's I, actually... England. I'll tell you, not, not England, no. Spain? No. <laughs> <laughs> this could be rather a long evening. But, um, it's actually Lithuania. Is it? Oh. It's starting <clears throat> 52 suicides per 100,000 head of population, more than 13 times higher than the United States, which has 4.1 per 100,000, and six and a half times that of Britain, with eight. Nobody has any idea why this should be. Is it because um, the capital is so difficult to spell and it to say, and it's it's one of those words that really must must be, be that. that must be that which is Vilnius, isn't it? Vilnius, yeah. it's not that hard to say. It's it is a big trick, isn't it? Vilnius, Vilnius, V I L N U I S. Can the audience please say Vilnius? One, two, three. Vilnius. Pretty easy. Pretty easy. I was just looking for an answer. I was definitely... <laughs> very good that you knew the answer was Vilnius. Yeah. Think it would be interesting. <laughs> If you got all of the suicide notes and publish them as a book. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yes. They might yeah. find out actually what the hell's going on in Vilnius. <laughs> it's the food. Yeah. <laughs> They're all sick of the food here. Clearly, again and again, the references. <laughs> um, your favourite painter coming up now, Alan, in this question. What was Caravaggio's real name? It sounds like Italian for car phone warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, Fabio. <laughs> Fabio. <laughs> You'd think that because he travelled, because of killing people, <laughs> it so would be he... Caraviaggio, like a lover of travel. Oh, very good. Except, but, yes, yes, dear, but... dear travel, yes. <laughs> but, but it's dear not. travel. No, no it's but real no, name is Michelangelo. No. Michelangelo. Yes. Oh, right, that is something. Yeah. Yeah. Did Derek joined. Jarman make a film about him? He did, he indeed. Did. called, simply. Caravaggio. Is that interesting sure. enough for a point? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Clearly it is. We're losing it. We're losing it. Losing it. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Caravaggio took the name Caravaggio sure. because his father, Fermo Marisi, uh, was the steward and chief architect of the Marquis of Caravaggio. <laughs> so, uh, uh, who invented the steam engine? Fingers on buzzers. Oh. Yes. It wasn't as a lot of people think. George Stevenson. Right. I said who did. Exactly. <laughs> that person would be um, a Mr. Trevithick. Very good. Very good. But that's very good. Um, and do you know that Richard Trevithick went into a pub one night? <laughs> and uh, it's true. They, they built a steam engine. Yes. And they got it up to pressure and they went into a pub, the whole gang of them. It's all absolutely yeah. true. And they got absolutely slaughtered. 
They forgot about the steam engine and it blew up and it just about oh. took about 10 houses Good Lord. Down. Well, of course, it was Richard and Andrew yeah. Trevithick who are yeah. credited with the modern invention, but the real answer, of course, is neither of those. It was Hero, or Hieron, of Alexandria in 100 AD. Oh, okay. It was called the Aelopile, or wind ball, um, using the same <laughs> principle as jet propulsion, a metal sphere spun around, uh, steam generated at 1500 RPM, making it the fastest rotating object in the world. The ancient Greeks uh, found it an amusing novelty, nothing more, but none of them thought it to put together with the railway, which amazingly had been invented 700 years earlier by no. Periander of Corinth, no. who had a railway, yes, but not steam powered. Uh, uh, powered by, by uh, human force. <laughs> Moving on. I know something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Stevenson's rocket went at 30 miles an hour, and they were sure that if, if you went at 30 miles an hour over, you would suffer irreparable brain damage. Mm. So they put fences alongside the track so that passers by wouldn't have to witness it and just losing it. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that the person who came up with that notion wasn't a medical doctor or anything like that. I suspect it was a fence maker. <laughs> <laughs> it's astonishing what people think will cause illness. The Romans thought that um, buggery caused earthquakes. Really? <laughs> if, if it's done right, if it's done right. <laughs> Lastly, what is the name of the 23rd tallest oh. tree in the world? <laughs> Well, like a Christian name, or other type of... Yeah. No, it's going to be Dave or something like that. <laughs> you... Giant redwood. <laughs> well, that is, that is the species of tree. It's certainly the sequoia, the giant redwood. But he has a name, 23rd <laughs> tallest... Lesser giant redwood. <laughs> the answer is... An, an, oh, you'll kick yourselves. Again? Uh, well, because it's, <laughs> it's themed. The answer is Adam. Oh, oh. First round. Remember that far back? No. no. <laughs> it's one of the 30 this named giant sequoias of the giant forest in California and is named, of course, after the first man. So we come full circle, just oh. in time, for the final score. Oh. <laughs> Alan. I've been really interesting. You have time. been so interesting. <laughs> and you've made many new friends here. <laughs> But you've only made minus five new points. Really? <laughs> in third place, with ten, it's John. And in second place, with eleven, is Hugh. But our runaway winner, with 18 QI points, is Danny Baker. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> It up for QI. It only remains for me to thank Danny, Alan, Hugh and John and to leave you with something quite interesting. And it's this local tidbit from The Independent. An army bomb unit was called to investigate a suspicious-looking package outside the Territorial Army Unit in Bristol. They blew up with a controlled explosion, the package, only to discover that it was a parcel of leaflets explaining how to deal with suspicious packages. <laughs> Welcome to QI. This is the show where everything is as bright as a new pin and we avoid clichés like the plague. You won't hear me saying that our four players are champing at the bit and raring to go, not in a month of Sundays. So, without further ado, let's meet and greet Bill Bailey, Sean Locke, Joe Brand and Alan Davis. Now, tonight, although this is Series B, we're talking about colour, so all of our buzzers are blue. Bill goes... <laughs> Sean goes... <laughs> Joe goes... <laughs> and Alan goes... <laughs> Genuine recording. Yeah. <laughs> you said that without moving your legs. Um, right, now, sweeties, you all have sweeties, and to help you get into a primary mood, a range of bright colours. And here's a nice Mediterranean one to get you started with. What colour was the sky in ancient Greece? Oh, yeah! Sure. <laughs> I don't know if that picture's anything. Oh, yeah, well, 
I'm afraid blue. Um, I should have. Uh, <laughs> I should have told you that it was ancient Greece, and I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we didn't. They didn't take photographs in ancient Greece, so that might have been. I think that the photograph was of modern Greece. Yeah. Well, when I know. But yes. You know, no. No. You fell into our that beautiful. Could be a very good carving. It could be, yeah. I suppose. Um, <laughs> Would it perhaps have been darker blue because it's sort of faded a little well, bit over your time? <laughs> <laughs> what we call blue, they call something else. Well, no, the ancient Greeks don't call, didn't call anything blue. They didn't look up ever. No, they didn't call anything <laughs> blue. They didn't have, have colours. No word for blue. They had colours, but they didn't have a word for blue. Ah. No word for blue. What do they say? The sky. Bronze. <laughs> bronze? Yes, they called it the bronze. Homer called it bronze but No time for these Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> and yet without them you wouldn't be here. Oh, that's so rubbish. You say this every week. <laughs> because it's true, because without we wouldn't logic, be here. mathematics, harmony, democracy, justice... That's got nothing to do with the people shagging for decades ending be... up with me. <laughs> there wouldn't be television. And without television you are nothing. I know that better than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> there, wouldn't be there wouldn't be a word for television. Yeah, a Greek word. Well, no, funny enough, television is uh, is a word that offends a lot of classicists because it's both Latin and Greek. It's, oh. it's, a, it's a hybrid word. They're so touchy, aren't they? They, they are. <laughs> they call it a chimeric word because it's, so, the tele is Greek and the vision is, is but Latin. But if there was no Greek, like the Saxon word for television would be something like... Uh, well, it would be like, like We know <laughs> what they are because the German, it would be fenzen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up, Sean. <laughs> Their flag. What do they call the flag? That's the modern and Greeks. Well, the modern Greeks. It's, not, we the don't blue, like them. it's not the blue. It's not the blue. Didn't exist. They didn't have a word for it. I would be here without the ancient Greeks. Is it, is it... I wonder how many Welsh words there are for colours, Alan Davis, well, when we start on this. Unfortunately, unfortunately, because of you English people destroying our natural culture and heritage, I don't know our own language. <laughs> Yes. I must apologise. Cruel imperial invader. <laughs> um, my great grandfather was forced to flee Cardiff and set up a restaurant in the East End. <laughs> Do you want to know something very interesting, Alan? There is no Welsh word for blue. Oh well, I'm sure there is. There is. There is. There is you no just can't Welsh say it. Word. There, there is. <laughs> So when, when did they hand over? When did ancient Greece hand over to modern Greece? That's well, so that's... there you go. <laughs> the first thing we're going to do, the sky is blue. All right, there you go. <laughs> start up. It's a very interesting question. <laughs> they used to believe, some Darwinians believed, that the Greeks genuinely, uh, that's to say Greeks as ancient as Homer, who was a very, very long time before even um, Sophocles and Socrates, the ancient Greeks that you and I talk about every day. Um, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> They, uh, they actually believed that they hadn't developed a colour sense in the eye, but it's now uh, essentially perceived that they didn't really find any use for calling things by different colours so much as they did as function. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> Am I boring you? Losing the will to let I'm so it. sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you just hit that over your, your buzzer there, uh, Al? Huh? Just that... Oh. That's just uh, an excerpt from a bronze movie, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in, in a similar spirit, uh, Homer regarded wine, the sea, and sheep as all being the same colour, which is red. To us, colours are so obvious that this seems peculiar, but colour is just one way of describing tones. Now, look at this picture. Uh, what does a rainbow look like from the other side? You can't nice. see it. It's slightly different. Yeah. Just <laughs> slightly different. Not, it's not... It's nice. It's <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's not, not as... Same. Mm, it's a bit... Yeah. Uh, no, it's look at it, you go, I'd rather look, be on the yeah. proper side, yeah. but it's all right. <laughs> 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 I it's wouldn't an bother answer. going round to look at it. No, no. Just go, no it's better this side. Long no, journey. Can't yeah. really concentrate on it because there are people going, come round, look at it from this side. <laughs> <laughs> but your first answer was correct, for which you will get. You can only see it from from the in, side that you're on. From in, <laughs> the... yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see it. No, there is a very particular way. It's you're to, to do to see with one. where the rain is and where you are. Or where the sun is. Where the sun yeah. is and the rain yeah. and where you are. There has to be sun. And the sun has to be behind you. Yeah. Because they're light coming from behind your head, uh, they're going through a raindrop, they're bouncing off the yep. back of a raindrop and coming back to your eye. And it can only happen at an angle of 42 degrees, which is why it's in a... In oh, a yeah. 
Can you tell me at what point in time human beings were actually able to sing a rainbow? Oh. <laughs> Is there a song about I singing a rainbow? I can sing a rainbow, <laughs> sing a rainbow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's loads of different ones, wasn't there? Grey and grey and grey and grey, grey and grey and grey. Yeah. I can yeah. sing yeah. a wood louse. You know, <laughs> 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 Very good. In Estonia, they believe that if you point at a rainbow, your finger will fall off. Oh, for God's sake. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Estonians aren't stupid people, are they? They yeah. aren't. They're very stumpy, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> indigo, incidentally. What do you know about indigo? Blue, isn't it? Purple. It's purple. It's really a funny colour. Do you well, remember what's the colour of. Um... Silence. Bit, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's the colour of audacity. See, I'm doing it now. I'm talking about like that. <laughs> it's the colour of audacity. <laughs> it's a sort of darky, darky <laughs> blue, isn't it? No, it's, isn't it a, a fertility thing? Well, it's 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 an it's an Indian plant that was used for dyeing. In what in what um, sense would it be a fertility <laughs> thing? <laughs> it's a colour, doesn't it? Doesn't it come up on women's legs in circles when they're ready? <laughs> Tiger. Are we thinking of Impetigo? Oh, <laughs> it comes up on Garters, garters, what you're saying. Very red Tiger. What indigo is indigo? indigo. It's, it's, it's a dark blue dye used for such things as jeans and um, mm. police uniforms. Mm. Uh, uh, which brings me, um, why, oh, why take the piss out of Newcastle? Uh, haven't got any toilets. Uh, <laughs> I've got no toilets. <laughs> And they hold it in. They're so hard, they can hold it in until they go on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why they talk out the side of their mouth like that. <laughs> Interesting theory. Is that wrong? Um, is it that the, uh, the urine is exceptionally pure because of the filtering process of brown ale? It used to be very pure. Right. But now no longer probably is. Newcastle was a major exporter of piss. <laughs> ah, in the 18th century. <laughs> What does urine contain? Uh, uri ammonia. Uric ammonia, good. Well, some sort of infection thing. If a jellyfish stings you, you've got to pee on your leg. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll give you a further thing. hint, which was that I introduced the question by saying... Anesthetic. In indigo was used a dying. for such things as policemen's uniforms. Yes. A dying agent. It, so ammonia was used in the dyeing industry. And Dye in North dying. Yorkshire, they had these great... Quarries where they mixed the ammonia and uh, and stones and things with woad and uh, came out with these these dyes. Newcastle's third biggest export <laughs> after coal and beer was wee wee. Do you think you could wee? In, does anyone ever weed into their own mouth? <laughs> yeah, you can be oh, certain see. people have done. I've seen babies do that. It's very funny. But they're sort of, you know they're lying wriggling, having been changed. We used to go they high into their the mouths. And... We used to have a toilet school, and it was a there was a urine up there, and then wall, and then a window. Yes. Oh, which is quite high. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Danny, the squirt, <laughs> <laughs> bending right quite far back like that, could we out of the window? Wow. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter was, in Newcastle, people had to pee into buckets, which were connected um, weekly. Ah. Um, uh, no, the reason that uh, policemen's uniforms used to be such a rich and impressive hue was that they had been whittled on by Geordies, ultimately. <laughs> Have you all enjoyed your sweeties? Yeah. Good. Yes. Which colours did you like best? Red, I think. Red, red. Now, that's interesting. Most children, when asked which colour they like most, will say red. When a food manufacturer wants to colour food red, he uses um, some one of these, in fact. Uh, it's food additive. It's this E120 colourant. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, what is E120 made from? Oh, yeah. A beetle of some sort. No, no, I'm <laughs> I rather predicted you would say that. It's rather unfair of us, because you're almost right. It's actually a bug, not a beetle. Oh, well... Um, well uh, what's we... the difference between a bug and a beetle, then? Oh, don't you ask You should remember that. of all people, because <laughs> we covered it... Um, Bugs suck things. We covered it last year. Well done, you did remember. Five points for remembering. What do beetles do? They don't suck. They well, they're, they're an order of insects. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a drink with a straw and they look at you like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not a bug, all right? <laughs>
The point is, Joe, bug is not just American slang for any insect. It's a specific scientific word. It has piercing mouth parts. Oh, in case and mandibles. Want. Yes, yes, mandibles. Right. You um, answered that like it was your nickname. Mandibles, <laughs> 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 yes. How could I have this? But, um, <laughs> this is a nickname, it's cool. Mandibles <laughs> fry. <laughs> but the point about, about this stuff, which is also called... Cochineal. Cochineal, yes, you can get some points back for that, of course. Yeah. Is that it is made from crushed insects. They're called Dactylopius coccus, um, and they're a kind of uh, bug, as I say, and it takes about 70,000 of them to make one pound of cochineal. We've moved away from cochineal because those people who don't like eating animals felt they were being conned by things that were supposedly vegetarian, like a team of Smarties, when yes. it turned out they had dead animals in them. And, of course, they're not kosher. E122, which we now use, except in Smarties. In Smarties, you're still eating the crushed... I mean, in crushed, crushed bugs. bugs. Yeah, with the red ones. But E122 is very bad if you have an allergy to aspirin, for example. It makes some people go very blotchy, it makes some people hyperactive. And, uh, <laughs> so it's an interesting issue. Well, can I stop yeah. there? Yep. Change my mind. I think I prefer green. Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh. um, Where did the whole notion of uh, crushing beetles to get their colouring from? I mean, arise. When did people think this? These foods are just not the right colour. I need a bit more pizzazz in my in my. Well, lunch. I think you only need to sort of imagine, don't you? I mean, you know, right. you're pounding maize in in Mexico, which is where this thing sort of started, and right. and, and a few of these beetles that live, they're all over the place. Right. Mm -hmm. it, and while fall you're in. pounding it, it goes all a rather beautiful pink colour. Wait a minute. And your husband says, "I like this new maize cake. This this pink polenta." They didn't start like crushing animals and slowly work their way down <laughs> to beetles. <laughs> Crush the squirrel. <laughs> no, that's no good, that colour. Next animal. That's <laughs> what I meant. Oh, look. <laughs> Send your buzzer off. That's what I meant. Also, they didn't say, I love this pink polenta. Mm. They said, the pink polenta, I love it. <laughs> so you think that... I want some more pink polenta. So you think this happened after the Spanish colonisation of Mexico? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not... oh. <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Are you telling me the Incas taught like Oxbridge graduates? Yeah. <laughs> well, however they taught it's really... I'm just going up to finish off Machu Picchu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Help me with these stones. It was really the Aztecs we were concerned with. Uh, but uh, in either case, never mind. Have you ever felt like your weapon's not big enough? <laughs> no. Nonsense, nonsense. No. So, no. <laughs> Let's move from bugs, from bugs to beetles. Right. Uh, Love the big polenta. Sure. <laughs> Beetle fences, as you probably know, are called. <laughs> Coleopterists. Very good, Coleopterists. Ah. Give, give you five points. Well, thank you very much. Press him on how the hell he knows that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, because uh, when I was a child, I... In Alan's been... world, what? knowing something is a kind of freakish <laughs> weird... <laughs> 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 I would love to know the mystery of this. Yeah. Well, welcome to well, my world of knowing. <laughs> the wonderful world of looking up things in books. You looked uh, it up in a book? No, no, because when I was a kid, I uh, collected butterflies. What were you called then? What was that? A lipidopterist. Lepidopter. I was a lipidopterist. Not a lipid collector, as you may have thought. <laughs> sort of run out and kind of kill them yourself. No, you catch them in a net and then you put them in a bottle with chloroform and they gradually... I oh, know, it's not. It's cruel. That's not very nice. So were you a lepidopterist oh, as well? I, I did I did a bit, a bit of bug hunting, yes. Did as, you? As the American I can see you running along with a big net. Tarquin! Tarquin, I got green. one! <laughs> <laughs> the flying toga in a big net. <laughs> But you're quite right. You're a coleopterist. Like, oh, I am an Aztec. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was a philatelist. Were you? Yeah. Is there a special word for someone who did metal work? Smith. I did a bit of that when I was a young well, man, yeah. Or a metallurgist. Yeah. yeah, loser, we call him. <laughs> Coleopterists, <laughs> who love people. Coleopterists are extremely busy people, far too busy to sit and watch television panellists dithering about. Uh, so we have to push on a bit if we want to keep them on board because they're very, very busy. How long is it since anyone discovered a new type of beetle? Oh, eight seconds. Eight seconds is quite recent, but it's not far off. Oh, yeah. uh, 700 years. No. <laughs> No one is forcing you to play this game. No one <laughs> to 
you kill her. You're a killer. You know. <laughs> I released them into the wild after they have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, that is it. it's in supreme irony uh, that moths got into the collection and ate them all. <laughs> It, well, it could be five. It's, it's about an hour. Since 1700, uh, they they reckoned that <laughs> uh, uh, new species was discovered on average at the rate of about one new species every six hours, but it's accelerated. There may be as many as 10 million different species of beetle, um, and uh, only 2,000 coleopterists in the world, supposedly. So many beetles, just not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The amazing thing about beetles, two-thirds of all insects are beetles. Uh, but even more, if you put all examples of plants and animal species in a row, every fifth one would be a beetle. Every tenth one would be a weevil, as it happens. So we come to the next question. Which is the odd one out of these three? A Ptiliaidae beetle, a camel, or the Sultan of Brunei? Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah. Is it a Ptiliaidae beetle? It is, correct. You'll get the points. Can you, can you elaborate? Um, well, I don't want to show off. <laughs> <laughs> the camel stores water in its hub. No. Well, I know the source of the Brunei. Hey. The source of Brunei. What do we know about the I don't know. You don't know. He, so. he, can, he can afford to pay pop stars to dance around in their knickers. Indeed He's he that can. rich. He's, He's that, that rich. He's that yeah. rich. Now, what do oh. rich people have in common with camels? The, the ability to sustain uh, water in their pumps. The inability... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. yeah. They're miserable all the time. <laughs> What can they not do? Um, pass through the, the eye of a needle. Heaven. Pass through the eye oh. of a needle. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Same than thing. Man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes, it is. So the point is, this little beetle is so small it can literally go through the eye of a needle, unlike a camel or a rich person. Oh. Yes. Uh, and they come in very, very varying sizes. Beetles. Uh, the biggest one, Titanus giganta, is huge. We have a sample of the second biggest one. This is the Hercules. Oh! Beetle. oh! <laughs> this is from the Natural History Museum in London. How many uh, examples of beetle do you think they have there? How many different? 820,000. No, it's a lot more. It's 12 million. Oh, they have 12 million. Uh, finally, we plunge into the land that knowledge forgot. Davisland, the place we call <laughs> general ignorance. So, <laughs> fingers on buzzers, please, for one last chance to avoid looking like complete Charlies. Firstly, and returning to our colour theme, what rhymes with orange? Oh. Nothing. Oh! Lordy bless. Flange. Flange. Orange. Orange. Can you think of any words that might rhyme with it? Orange. Orange would rhyme with it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there is such a thing as orange. There's orange. No, orange. Orange. That's what. That's what you suck up. Um, <laughs> so, so Locke's making it up, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's terribly close, because there's Blorange. Blorange? It's a place. Anyone Blorange know where Blorange like... is? Well, it sounds like it's in Belgium. No, closer to home. Blorange. <laughs> where? Uh, where is it? Is it? <laughs> it, is. it is. It overlooks Abergavenny. It has a famous car park. <laughs> Well, it's a, a, it's a, a horse is buried there, a famous horse called Fox Hunter. There's also Gorringe. If you say porridge with a cold. Yeah. Yes. Porridge. Oh, I've got a cold. Oh, I've some porridge. porridge. <laughs> Lester Piggott, he goes, Oh, we're the great with Lester. Oh, I'm porridge. Porridge. <laughs> I'm sure that Richard Whiteley on Countdown said that nothing rhymes with orange. He may well have done, but we're here to explode the myths Richard of the Whiteley. Whiteley. Explode Richard Whiteley. <laughs> here we are, Gorringe. It's a surname. It's probably the same word as Göring. My prep school tailors were called Gorringe, really? funnily enough. Really? We get our uniforms made, yeah. Go yeah. <laughs> For like a suit you wear when you're five. That was. <laughs> when you bought in the like, 1850s. No. <laughs> you had. I shall measure up, young sir. We <laughs> short some cash, particular outfitter. <laughs> it was the school outfit. All right. <laughs> Which was a tailoring shop, an outfit school outfit Which called Gorringe. Which side does young sir dress on? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing really to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that. It's written on the toilet wall. <laughs> oh, 
why did I mention that? That's you want to get measured up for sure? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, would, you, would Sir like to wear a cravat on the cross country run? <laughs> Such beasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Gorringe is a splendid English. So, I suggest, uh, I suggest a cover band Australia for geography. <laughs> 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 Sex. <laughs> 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 you rather like this pink Poland tart. <laughs> I feel rotted. Gorringe. Gorringe is the splendid English surname of, amongst others, Henry Honeychurch Gorringe, who brought uh, Cleopatra's needle to, to New York Central Park, in case you didn't know. Anyway, what colour... What colour, fingers on buzzers, what colour is the planet Mars? Oh, yes, Joe. Yeah. It's red. Oh, oh I knew that was going to happen. Well, it may be called the red planet, but it isn't red. I'm afraid it's actually Rusty brown. Rusty brown. It's browny brown, really. No, it only appears red sometimes because of the dust in, uh, in, in, in the atmosphere. In fact, <laughs> its landscape is a very boring brown colour. Why According... are you going there? What's the point? Oh, you... <laughs> you are just unbelievable. <laughs> I see. I see. Yes. I see. Right. I refuse to rise to debate. <laughs> All right. According to New Scientist, actually, the most recent pictures of Mars issued by NASA were tweaked no. by sort of, uh, po you know, by using filters and <laughs> Photoshop. Exactly. Putting spears on it. In order to conform... <laughs> they were tweaked in order to conform with our expectations of its redness. Next, apropos of absolutely nothing at all, uh, a topical one. What prevented Henry VIII from marrying Lord Pembroke? Oh, Joe. Yeah. Lady Pembroke. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. Um, <laughs> because gay marriages were illegal. Oh, he's done. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, the fact is, he actually did marry Lord Pembroke, eventually. He married Lord Pembroke. Yes, he did. <laughs> was Lord Pembroke a nickname for... A lady. A, lady. a lady! Lord Pembroke was certainly a lady, but it, absolutely, it was Anne Boleyn, in fact. All oh, right. She was married to Catherine of Aragon at the time, and the, the, uh, it was not head of the church. She thing. disguised herself as a man to sneak no. into the king's chamber. No, she was just very miffed at not being able to marry. <laughs> you sound like you're in a school play, then. <laughs> <laughs> She decided herself as a man. Really? You're not supposed to be an actor. Have you never seen Jonathan Creek? Um, no. <laughs> she disguised herself as a man. The speech is in the chamber. I must leave for France. <laughs> Yes, what happened was he was married to Catherine of Aragon. The Pope, the Pope was head of the church in England and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and Anne Boleyn was very annoyed, so he, to, to shut her up, he offered her a title. And he first he offered her an ordinary title. He said, no, I want a proper title. So he, he gave her the Marquisate of, of Pembroke. And so she became the Marquis of, of, of Pembroke, which is a male title, of course. Yeah. But then eventually he did overcome it and declare that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was null and void and yeah. separated from Rome and married Anne Boleyn and then cut her head off, of course. Anyway, from Marquises to mammals, I'm one, you're one, Lord Pembroke. Pembroke. She was one as well. We're all mammals. We come in a wide variety of colours. White rhinos, black panthers, brown bears, whales, red kangaroos, the blue, blue whales, whales, pink elephants, ha-ha. But no, there are... Name a green mammal. Uh... Yes. Frog. Frog. <laughs> now name a green mammal! <laughs> Yes, Joe. Yeah. A fudgy. <laughs> now name a green mammal. <laughs> right. um... Okay, a rotten badger. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We've all seen them. Yeah, that's a good one. Green no, mammal. There are chameleon. Is that no, a mammal? Chameleon is a lizard. A really, really jealous shrew. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are none. They're very common to birds. Uh, reptiles, uh, fish, but there are no green mammals. There is a sloth that looks green, but it's actually the algae that grow in its fur. But that's that's the only. Well, because it's so show. slow moving, and moss exactly. grows over. <laughs> <laughs> so much a sloth, exactly. <laughs> Lastly, we come full circle to the mad, mad world, Alan, of ancient Greece. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Ooh, would... <laughs> 
an ancient <laughs> Greek... <laughs> Why wouldn't an ancient Greek baker mind if you told him where he could stick his baguette? Sure. Because they were a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. You know, I think you all know. I'm not going to say it. Because you can't these days. Oh, very hot water. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> God, I always thought all. it was Bertrand Russell talking then for a minute. <laughs> As a pleasuring device? A bread dildo. A dildo. A bread dildo is the right answer. They made their dildos out of bread in Greece. Oh. You know that most women would have gone for the eating option. <laughs> <laughs> Did someone write that down? Is that written down in ancient Greek? It's only discovered in 1987, actually. It's a very recent discovery. Who discovered it? It was a Greek baker frozen in a glacier. <laughs> 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 he was handing the baton of ancient Greece to modern. <laughs> it's time for the final reckoning. I shall give scores now. Just in last fourth place, just with minus 22, is Adam Davis. <laughs> but a brilliant performance, and we well thank done. you for it. In third place with minus 20 is Joe Brand. <laughs> Second place with a huge plus seven is Bill. Oh. But way out in front with 17 is Sean Lockwood. Oh, well. well, my thanks go to Bill, Sean, Joe and Alan. I'm going to leave you with two quite interesting remarks on the subject of colour. The first is from Frank Borman, the Apollo 8 astronaut. My experience helped me to see how isolated and fragile the Earth really is. It was also beautiful. It was the only object in the entire universe that was neither black nor white. And the second is from former US President Gerald Ford. Ronald Reagan doesn't dye his hair. He's just prematurely orange. <laughs> to QI, where once again we lurch off the information superhighway to ramble the bumpy byroads of bovinity. In the back of the bus tonight, we have Bill Bailey. <laughs> Rich Hall. <laughs> Rob Bryden. <laughs> and Alan Davis. Well, if we're all aboard, let's go and try our buzzers. Bill goes. <laughs> and Rob goes. Baby, till I want no more. <laughs> <laughs> and Ridge goes. <laughs> uh, how is that a bus? It's a no. dog being hit by a bus. Oh. <laughs> a greyhound, presumably. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Alan goes. Real song, the bus guy. And we start this evening with cartography. What's quite interesting about the most detailed map of Britain? That isn't well. the most detailed map of No, that, no, that is an example. Surely, because I've map seen you... maps certainly that have my road on, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, is it the Ordnance Survey? That's very good. It is indeed the Ordnance Survey map. So what you'd need, then, would be a kind of real life-size map. No. <laughs> Where would you unfold that? You'd probably have to do it in Canada. <laughs> is it a secret map? A secret map which shows that Cornwall and Devon's actually a little bit further away? <laughs> But it's a bit of conspiracy with the tourist industry to make it seem it's a little bit nearer, but it it's actually not. All the portals and wormhole, wormholes in space. And the wormholes. The wormholes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <That's laughs> wormhole. <laughs> you like a wormhole, do you? I love a wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> There is a map. There is a map which I think uh, MI5 have, which shows which shows not just Hadrian's Wall, but you see Hadrian's uh, Conservatory yeah. and, and, and Hadrian's water feature, which, which which is very nice. It sort of cascades down over pebbles. Yes, uh, Carlisle is in a sense Hadrian's sliding patio door, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but 
Now, this is an OS map, an Ordnance Survey map. It's yeah. been published in 2002. What's really quite interesting about it, I think we might focus on the price of it. How much would you pay for a copy of...? Four ninety nine. Yeah. 4 is amazingly close. It comes out on CD, actually, because it's very detailed. It shows pillar boxes. Actually. Is this the sort of thing you get in satellite navigation in cars? Because I, I had that on when I was on tour, and, uh, we, and it's useless. You get to Milton Keynes, it just goes, turn left, turn left, turn left, turn left, turn left, turn left. Well, it's not good if you're insecure, because she says, you have missed your destination. <laughs> and that, that can get you right there, you know? <laughs> I have a gun sight, you know, a telescopic gun sight. I don't know what message that is sending out. When you get to your destination, there's a gun sight, so you have reached your destination. Now slaughter the family. Yeah. <laughs> kill them, kill them all. Kill them. Um, kill them. Well, it's, it's very detailed. It's on CD-ROM, and what's perhaps surprising about it is its cost. It costs £4,990,000. So when you said 499, you were oddly right. <laughs> Pay it in one go, Stephen, surely. Don't they do it over easy payments? As yes. you get each sex from the map, it builds to this wonderful collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, each, each town is £30,000. Port Talbot? They're not going to charge £30,000 for Port Talbot, Stephen. Talbot? They're, they're not going to get that. Is that not Come on. No, no, no. He's on the South Wales coast, Bunny John. Yes, yes, yes. No, you'd be lucky to get 15 quid for that in a really? while. <laughs> It's the hometown of such great actors as Rob Brydon and Anthony Hopkins <laughs> and, Richard and, and Richard Burton and Burton. Michael Sheen. Richard Burton. 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 Sorry, Burton. 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 Sorry, thank you. Burton. Will you stop saying Burton at me, please? Sorry. It's beginning to frighten me. <laughs> uh, yes, well, Patalbert may be less than £30,000, but well, it's like that old joke, isn't it, about the atomic bomb going off in Cardiff and causing £7 worth of damage. <laughs> Like something you took, you put on your computer, and it shows you where everybody is. Yeah. And all the animals, all the little foxes. I want to focus. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, all the rats in England all face the same direction at any given time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Because right. they're magnetic, aren't they, rats? Yeah. <laughs> They spend so yeah. long in lead-lined sewage pipes that they move with the curved chair of the yeah. earth. Right. Hence the phrase, there's rat and true rat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute rat. They do. It's very hard for, for rat couples who, who have that kind of reverse polarity going on. You know, when you can't put two magnets oh, yeah. together, and there are rats who fall in love, and, and they are destined to be together, and they can't, they can't kiss. They jump in. So, they, they get to that, but they get about that close, and stop. <laughs> And they're staring at their ass. That's right, they've got all iron filings at the whiskers. Yeah. yeah. Five million pounds, I would want a map that showed me looking at the map I just bought. <laughs> you are here. You are here. Yeah, yeah. It does seem pricey, I grudge it. The word map comes from the Latin for map. maps. You know. <laughs> it comes from the Latin word mapper as in Mappa Mundi, yeah. but it actually meant a napkin. They would draw maps on cloth on a napkin, so it became known as a mapper, and then it just extended to, to a map. Rob, what's the difference between a Carlisle surprise, a reverse Canterbury pleasure, and a sheep tied to a lamppost in Cardiff? <laughs> now, this is another example of the institutionalised racism <laughs> <laughs> which is accepted when it's directed towards the Welsh, yeah. <laughs> as it has been. Done. Is this a reference to the joke about the about what is a sheep tied to a lamppost in Cardiff? It's a leisure centre. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 and, and you know, no, you no, know, no. And, and you know, no. <laughs> What is the difference? Well, the only thing I have knowledge of is the sheep type. No, I mean, I, sorry, I have knowledge of Cardiff. <laughs> I don't. Well, I'm not really aware what, what a Carlisle surprise is, other than the shock of finding yourself at Carlisle. Um, <laughs> sort of nice which would be surely more of a delight than anything yes, else. Yes, total delight. Um, a reverse Canterbury. The full name is a reverse Canterbury pleasure, place double. It's an ancient English pastime. Um, Was it Morris dancing? Is it a not, type of Morris dance? Not Morris dancing, no. It, it has musical Break dancing. nature. <laughs> it's not a dance. It's really big. It's as big a musical instrument as you could ever find. Or a whale. I <laughs> said with a whale, you just put your hand over the blowhole. <laughs> the whale's on 
He's making jokes about whales. <laughs> um, no. Um, the name for this pastime comes from originally from the Latin for countryside, but a particular part of the Latin countryside called Campania. And so it's oh, called bells, campanology. Bells. Uh, Absolutely yes, bells. right. It's bell ringing. Yes. Bell ringing. Bell ringing. It's bells. Oh, well, and they're tunes, or rather methods, as bell ringers call them. They're uniquely English. And if you have six bells, there are how many different permutations of six bells? Well, six times five times four times three times two. Lots and it's lots. 720. And, lots. Oh, and if you right. play through each one of those permutations, that's called a peel. Of bells, and it's yeah. also called an English phrase we use quite a lot ringing the changes, because those uh, sequences are called uh, changes. Yeah. That's where the phrase to ring the changes yeah. comes yeah. from. Quite interesting. Because if you have 12 bells, there are 479,001,600 variations. So that would take 38 years to ring a peal of 12 bells. Wow. Um, Amazing thought, isn't it? When I was growing up, if my dad hit his thumb with, with a hammer, which he didn't do often, but occasionally just for a bit of something a bit different, you know, yeah. you do it. <laughs> he would say, hell's bells and buckets of blood. It's a good phrase, hell's bells and buckets of blood. Sounds good, doesn't it? Good way of getting out of his system. Yeah. I'd say f <laughs> <and things> like <laughs> that. Yeah, um, anyway, I remember the first time I heard my mother say f I could not believe it because my brother and I thought we'd made the word up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I said f my dad heard me walk by my bedroom door and I said, Dad, shut the door, I'm trying to f in here. <laughs> Peeling bells was considered in the 17th century um, something of a vice. John Bunyan denounced it, along with dancing, playing tip cat, and reading the history of Sir Bevis of Southampton. What was, what was that? Tip cat. Tip cat. Tip cat. Tip We just tip the cat. Tip the cat. It goes onto its side. Tip it back up. Yeah. All right. Well, it was the Chinese who gave us bells, you know, 1200 BC. Three yeah. Chinese claimed to have invented absolutely everything. They did, yeah. <laughs> they and did. all I say to the Chinese is, why didn't you invent the camera 1200 years ago so we could prove it? <laughs> Which brings us back to Alan and maps. What? What have I done? Well, now there's a question for you. There's 100 points in this if you get it. 100 nectar points? No. <laughs> Oh, 100 well, points. If you can tell me which was the last place in Britain to convert to Christianity. Oh. God, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's got... Uh... <laughs> any, any... No, no. Mm. <laughs> Go on. The then. summit of Ben Nevis. <laughs> It's you. Two guys. Underground. Hey, what's this no. Christianity? <laughs> Is that on the side of the table? Is it a place called uh, Satan is my master? Or... <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced Simster. <laughs> <laughs> is it now on the British mainland or is it something going to be like the Fort? The Lake District. No, it's not the Lake District. This is not on the British mainland. Essex. <laughs> I repeat, it is not on the British mainland. It's not on the British mainland. It's... Essex is not culturally on the British mainland, but... <laughs> the Isle of Man. Oh, yes. Isle of Wight? Yes! No! It's the Isle of Wight. <laughs> um, oh, well done. Flashing <laughs> four. That was a total guess. It was, <laughs> of course. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Yeah. No, it's surprising because you would imagine, of course, that uh, the, the Isle of Wight was about the, the first needles. place the Christians yeah. would come to. Meals on the bus, <laughs> The needles. Yes, darling, those are called the needles. <laughs> Very good. One point to you for knowing about the needles. <laughs> Top work. Um, <laughs> what do you know about the Isle of Wight? All the clocks stopped in 1952, and all the shops are the same as they were then. <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> it does seem a little like that, doesn't it? Yes, there's one uh, species of animal that's uh, still... Dog, cat, rat, mouse. ...hasn't made it to the Isle of Wight. Horses. No, there are horses on the Isle of Wight. Okay. Well, most people fox. are rather pleased this animal hasn't made it, not a fox. Flea. 
Snake. Oh, the rat, because of the magnet. No, it's often called... <laughs> it's, often, it's, it's often called a kind of rat, like pigeons. Mouse. Ah. Squirrel, 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 the squirrel. The grey squirrel. Squirrel. Ah. The grey squirrel. squirrel. All right, all right, squirrel. Right. Right. Steven. <laughs> yes, right. yes. Steven. I was going, Steven. yes. Shut up, Bill. All right, Steven. Squirrel. Steven. You made the point. Squirrel. The grey... The grey squirrel. The grey, the North American grey squirrel. Don't say squirrel. The North American grey squirrel. I'm very good in the first person to get that. Oh, no, we're oh, 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 Rob, I wouldn't do that to you. This is oh, an editing masterclass. Little face. <laughs> editing masterclass, you say. All right. Yeah. The North American grey squirrel? Red squirrel. <laughs> the red squirrel can't live with the grey squirrel. Ebony and Ivory are together on my piano key keyboard, so why can't they be? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Why can't you mean a kind of squirrel fur keyboard? <laughs> That's Very barbaric. Bit. Are you saying you want pianos clad in the pelt of a squirrel? <laughs> if that's what you're saying, Fry, you should be stopped. <laughs> Isle of Wight was the last place in Britain to be invaded by the French, by a foreign power. How did power. they miss that, then? Sorry? How do they miss the other? Do they go onto the mainland and then straight up? Oh, Christianity? Yeah. Yes, I they, don't know. It's all, doesn't it? When they, they came back, they went, hang on, what's Who'd <laughs> <laughs> left this uh, bit out? I see, they're yeah. worshipping Satan. It was in uh, 686 AD, almost a century after the rest of the country. Subjugated by Codwalla, who was king of the West Saxons and who had to kill most of the pagan population to Christianize it. <laughs> Good old Christianity. <laughs> Talking of Christianity, Rich, could Jesus walk on custard? What? That? <laughs> At one point when he was a children's entertainer, he might. <laughs> Like a sarcastic question you would ask Jesus. Oh, water. Yeah, great. What about custard? <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much a question of could he, Stephen. No. I mean, that's well, been so he did. He did. He did it. I mean, it was it was very hard to stop him. Actually, <laughs> this this was one. This come out in research recently. This was one of the Lord's favourite pastime. Out with the bread, out with the fish. Look what I got for dessert. <laughs> Somebody hold my shoes. And he'd be, <laughs> you know, and he'd, he'd be doing it. <laughs> It was just it was just water, wasn't it? The lake. And and he'd just go custard, yeah. custard. Yeah. Custard. Yeah. custard, jelly, custard, yeah. instant whip, yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did he walk on a lake of custard, or did he have a lots of bowls of custard and <laughs> stuff <laughs> between them? Like that? Well, the fact is, not only could Jesus walk on custard, you can walk on custard, I, I can. can walk on custard. I can. All of us Anybody can. can walk on custard, as this experiment by the Sky One program Brainiac clearly shows. <laughs> There you are. That is not a fraud. That is absolutely real. It's a non-Newtonian dilatant fluid. And it's, it's honestly true. This. Mm, it lovely. means that the more pressure you put on it, the more weight you put on it, the harder and firmer it becomes. You could slowly put oh your boy. finger Here through it. This <laughs> is raising images. Your finger slips wow. in smoothly. <laughs> It's, no, oh, please yeah, help me out here. Yeah. But uh, if you slap it hard, help me out. No. <laughs> oh dear! A normal bowl Man. of custard we know would support a fly, and we know it wouldn't support a man. So somewhere, no, somewhere in in between those two examples, would it support, for example, a vole or no. a mouse? <laughs> Probably. I Children at, everywhere all over the country will now be putting their hands walking on custard. <laughs> in bowls of custard. <laughs> Children, whatever you do, please, please try and walk on as much custard as you can. <laughs> um, we turn now to the darker side of entertainment. Name the teams at the Colosseum, the ancient room. Christians and the Lions. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. The fact is, no, there is no evidence whatsoever that no Lions team sports. were put against Christians. Sorry? There weren't any team sports. It was every man for himself. I've seen it in that film. <laughs> <laughs> what which film would that be? The one about the gladiator. Called Gladiator? Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> oh, the, the, the floor opens like that and tigers come out. Yeah. They spring out, don't they? Yeah. And do you remember the name of the emperor played by Joaquin Phoenix? In what that was his film? name? Oh, goodness. Oliver Reed. Oh, God. No. <laughs> Right area. No, not really, dear, no. Commodus. Commodus, Commodus, Commodus. Commodus was. Good on the, on the Roman emperors, are you? No. no. I know me champagne names, but I don't know me Roman emperors. Hyper Heights it. No, no. 
That's fine. You know, no, mean the bottle. No, names. the bottle. Never drink Jeroboam's and things. Sh- Salamanazar. Oh, well, Magnum. All that. They're all um, Rehoboam. They were all ancient biblical kings, except Magnum, who was an Terrible. 80s detective. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Christians were ever thrown to the lions at the Colosseum. Well, this is attested by that, learned then? research. But the Christians caused an awful lot of trouble for the Romans. I'm, I bet they were tempted to chuck them in and have them eaten by lions. Well, they did certain things. Them. Nero had them making human torches lining the Appian Way for dozens and dozens of miles. So, I mean, they were certainly pretty nasty to the Christians, but then the Christians won. They took over the Roman Empire. Anyway, uh, back to cartography, our favourite subject, and an easy one for you. In the Middle Ages, what shape did people think the world was? Flat. I know we all think they did, but there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. They all thought it was round, they all wrote about it as round, the Greeks knew that it was round. Round and flat. No, they thought it was a sphere. Terry Jones, the python, who, who is something of a medievalist, as you may know, he, say, he blames Washington Irving, the American writer, for, for one of those being who started this lie, as he puts it. The Greeks knew it was round, he says. Chaucer knew it was round. Roger Bacon wrote about the curvature of the Earth in the 13th century. So, apparently... Well, I think the majority of people didn't really care. No. <laughs> but they started. As indeed, we don't now actually care that it's round. If it was square, it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> I'd rush to the edge. <laughs> I'd want to go right to the corner. And sit on the corner. <laughs> How do we know it's round? Yeah, uh, huh? Mm-hmm. Round the world tickets. One is photographing it. <laughs> <laughs> photographing it was a very big help. We took a photograph and we saw that it was yes, round. Yes, but then you could say that about anything about people going to the moon and we know yeah. they didn't. If it weren't round, <laughs> all the flights of aeroplanes, if it weren't round, we just nothing that we. How used do we to know they work. just don't like, fly the circle round for a bit and let you think that you're going miles and miles and miles <laughs> and just come down like you know a couple of hours away and they've set Russia up a lot nearer than it is. <laughs> it's a really, 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 really long oblong shape on a track like a like an electric bike <laughs> and they we just, just move it. Whizzing the plane goes up, the plane doesn't move. <laughs> they move the country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are all the stars round? I can't answer that. Um, I think probably most. But yet you know what people thought 500 years ago. (laughs) Can I read books? Yes. Have I visited every star in the universe? No. (laughs) Is that something that you find difficult to understand? (laughs) Um, (laughs) You set me off. You set Sir off (laughs) again. Don't you think that this series has reached the point with such, with a dedicated following who trust us that this would be the point where you could say just one thing in a show, you could say just like this, the, the world isn't round. It's been proven. Most people will now believe it to watch this show. Well, yes. I can say with some confidence, ladies and gentlemen, the world is not round. It is an oblate spheroid. <laughs> No, that's not that. what I meant. No, I'm sorry. I was being literally... Pine cone. If you'd said the world is shaped like a pine cone. <laughs> Just to see how many letters we get. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, wouldn't it? Get some at last, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the, uh, well, you know who you are, don't you? <laughs> and I tried it and it was a disaster. <laughs> um, listen, no, since the 4th century BC, almost no one in the history of the world has believed that the Earth is flat. It's a common misconception, and indeed the song lyric, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. But he didn't think uh, that the world was round, he thought it was actually pear-shaped, funnily enough. Which brings us, ladies and gentlemen, drifting safely home into the harbour of half-grasped truths that we call general ignorance. So, fingers on your buses, please. What is a taffy pull? Is this another dig at my forefathers? You've what got is forefathers? It? The Welsh are weird. <laughs> uh, a taffy pull is when you, you try and pull a woman in Wales. It's, it's a Welsh oh dear. line. Oh, oh no! Come for it! <laughs> word for word! I suspect that young Rich might know, because you know taffy. what a taffy is. Yeah. Which is? It's uh, long strands of uh, sugary candy and at like county fairs and stuff. Absolutely. We don't have it here, but it's toffee, really. Toffee becomes taffy in America. Yeah. Taffy. Uh, but it is taffy. It's different to English toffee because it's chewy and soft and resistant all the way through. And one of the reasons for this is that they pull on metal hooks and they kind of aerate it. They do this business, don't they? And it was a social event, I believe. It was a way of people meeting each other at a taffy oh, yeah. pull. Your mom and I met at a taffy pull. <laughs> <laughs> but it was often called salt water taffy, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know why? 
That's because it's made from salt water. <laughs> It isn't. It doesn't have any salt water anywhere near it, of course. No, apparently in Atlanta in the 18-somethings, there was a shop that sold taffy and there was a, fl a flood. You know, the tide came in too far and it covered all his stock and someone came in and said, well, you should sell it as salt water taffy. Maybe people will buy it. And so he did. In fact, it wasn't salt-tainted and the name just seemed to stick. Uh -huh. Some people believe that story, some people don't. Fingers still on your buses, please. How many sheep were there on Noah's Ark? <laughs> Surely. Nice, no aesthetic. Somebody. Hey, okay, it's a trick. None. They were floating on a raft behind the. <laughs> no, there were sheep on no, the. No, no, none because they were walking on the custard. Yeah. <laughs> Side. No one never built yeah. an ark. It didn't actually happen. Well, yeah. according to the Bible, how Two. many? Yes, there was oh, a... <laughs> <laughs> Just get it over with yes, that way. Right. No, it's a common mistake. People haven't read the Bible much these days, but I can read to you from Genesis chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Why do of you ev talk like that? Well... <laughs> Well, he, he spoke Hebrew, didn't he, dear? This is a translation into English, you see. Um, but they spoke like that when they really could speak English, Alan. I think in 500 years' time, when they hear the things we've said, and perhaps even things you've said, they might go... Don't Jesus. pick on me. You're quoting no, from a me. mythical being. No. <laughs> I'm just reading. There were but... two of everyone. They went in two by how, two. How would you know Even that? my nephew knows yes. that. Yes, yes. How would you know <laughs> The only source of information we have for Noah's Ark is the Bible. Rubbish. And this is what it says. <laughs> listen, just listen. Yeah. Will you listen first and then comment? Will you agree to do that? I read it. Jane's fighting ships. Of every... <laughs> of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. And yes. sheep are accounted clean beasts. Oh. So there would have been He's seven. He's never lived with one. No, <laughs> it's really according to the kosher law. So pigs there would not have been. Okay. Camels would have been in twos. But the clean beasts came in sevens. Maybe they could breed more and so on. Anyway, I well, agree with you. It's a surprise. Everybody Good thinks Lord. in the Bible. And it says two by two. By two. Hurrah, exactly. Hurrah, hurrah. <laughs> Except the camels, because they were filthy. Hurrah. <laughs> hurrah. <laughs> so then the sheep, but not the then. The then came the amoeba. One, no two, seven, no four, no eight, no six. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the ferries and ships nowadays go, is not allowed to take animals on them, which is no, no, no. <laughs> ultimate irony. That's a good point. You, you wonder what Noah would make of that. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Why, would they, uh, why would they say seven animals? Because that, that means three pair and one animal. One to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Enough, enough. Now we come full circle, back to the beginning. What was the name of the Archbishop murdered by Henry II? Uh, Thomas oh. is a, No, not him. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, Have a go. I'm not going to fall into that trap. It wasn't no. Henry II who did kill Thomas a Beckett. Thomas a Beckett. His name was not Thomas Uh anything. The Uh is a complete error. John Stripe, in the memorials of Thomas Cranmer, writes, It is a small error, but being so oft repeated, deserveth to be observed and corrected. The name of that archbishop was Thomas Beckett, nor can it otherwise be found to have been written in any authentic history, record, calendar, or other book. If the vulgar did formerly, as it doth now, call him Thomas a Beckett, vulgar, uh, their mistake is not to be followed by learned men. <laughs> was, it, was it just a pause? Was it Thomas? Uh, uh, Beckett. Uh, <laughs> is the same true of Simon Le Bon? <laughs> <laughs> is he just Simon Bond? I don't think he'd have the respect he has Lindsay if he was DePaul. just... Yeah. Lindsay DuPaul. Yeah. Lindsay DuPaul. Whiskey a go-go. Yes. Legs <laughs> <Fun>. akimbo. <laughs> It's time now for the sorry-ass business of the scores and a clear leader, winner and victor tonight in Rich Hall with eight points, ladies and gentlemen. In second place with minus five points, Bill Bailey.
In third place with minus 16 is Rob Brighton. But our runaway loser with minus 25, Alan Davis. Well, that's it from QI for another week. My thanks to Rich, Rob, Bill and Alan. I leave you with this cautionary thought. Captain Cook may have observed the transit of Venus in 1769, but he never lived to see the Venus de Milo, which wasn't discovered till 1820. Will Rogers saw it, though, and observed to his niece, see what'll happen if you don't start biting your fingernails. <laughs>
it's very rare that first world countries get in invaded, but if they did, you could have a shoot out in a multiplex, couldn't you? <laughs> if, you uh, like a if you lived in South London, you'd you'd find a lot of wars in shopping <laughs> centres. <laughs> I've been arrested in a shopping centre. Have you tell us why? For an act of war? I knocked a security guard's hat off. <laughs> Oh, a very Bertie Worcester thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even do it on purpose, I was taking my jumper off. <laughs> I was absolutely arsehole as well. <laughs> <laughs> and you're very much here in my side of the story. <laughs> yeah. I um, called it actually rather a story of defence. <laughs> well, I read a thing once that said a third of all accidents at work go unreported. How do they know? <laughs> <laughs> Lumberjacks have the most dangerous job in America, it appears. 122 deaths per 100,000 employees. So that song's entirely wrong, is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How could you die doing that? Just trees falling on you? Would that, would that You're be saying it? trees falling on you like that's a bit of a pansy way to go. That's, <laughs> that's, not, that's a legitimate way to die. It's just the only real sort of peril, isn't it? There's yeah. not chainsaws. But also you're not mm. very well protected in panties and a bra, are you? <laughs> And also, if you're lumberjack, you're supposed to be good at it. It's not supposed to chop down trees and go, oh, it's the other side, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. The single most dangerous specific job is said to be an Alaskan crab fisherman. Is this the most dangerous jobs in America? Because how many presidents have they had? They've had a lot of those go. But only three have been assassinated. Three have been assassinated and one had a blowjob in the office. <laughs> <laughs> It's a job you boat. turn down straight away. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, yes. According to the United Nations, more than two million people die from work-related accidents, as opposed to 650,000 people a year who die in wars. Now, what was the most dangerous military stratagem ever devised? Vehicles reversing. Was it Hannibal's first crack at the Alps with chihuahuas? <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of this one was to terrify the enemy. Imagine you're in the front line of an army and you're massing against the front line of another army and the front line of the opposing army does something so extraordinary that you think, oh, my God, we're never going to beat them. Is it from a carry-on film? Is it when they lifted their, <laughs> when they lifted their kilts and they didn't wear pants? It was amazing. <laughs> carry-on Braveheart. No, it's neither of those. Um, they flagellate themselves. They insert something within them. They pants. chop their they own heads off. off. They chop their own heads off. Their own heads. The front line of the army chops their heads off. How, how you do that? Grab your hair and just slice with a very sharp sword. Who was that then? The Scots Guards? This was, this was in 496 BC. It would be the Swiss Army, because they'd have something on one of those little knives. No, it is, wouldn't it? <laughs> Self decapitation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a country you know well, and you're wearing its flag at the this moment. This is the flag of Vietnam. Well, that's right. We're talking 496 BC, the army of King Gujian of Yue. And he had convicted mm. criminals in the front line and told them they had to cut their own heads off. You may say, well, why would they do that? What's the worst that could happen? The worst <laughs> that could happen was if they didn't, then all their families and all their children would be massacred as well. Yeah, f*** it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't seem to worry. They knew they were going to die anyway. They were condemned to death. What do we know about decapitation? Does it kill you straight away? I know if you cut a duck's legs off, it can still swim. <laughs> Right. It can float, but it can't swim. <laughs> float? <laughs> Floating I'll duck. leave a little bit of stumpage. No. <laughs> it, wouldn't be to, it would have to catch the currents. It would evolve into a whole different animal. It would yeah. probably get a, a wing up as a sail or something no, like that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they discover, like, for example, at the French Revolution with the guillotine that like, heads could kind of, like, chat about Carry on after. chatting. So... Well, no, you're right. There was a story during the terror of the French Revolution that uh, two members of the, the National Assembly were guillotined and their heads put in the same bag straight away, and one bit the other so hard they couldn't be separated. What, just the heads? Mm. That's holding a grudge, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, you're dead. Let it go. <laughs> yeah, you didn't get on. Whatever. They were French. Well, anyway, from decapitation to another kind of danger, what is the most dangerous sport in, in fact, the most dangerous country in the world? Contemporary dance in Scotland. <laughs> Hopscotch in Afghanistan? I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're very close. 
Well, it's going to be Afghanistan or Iraq, isn't it? I well, think quite too. Odd enough, in between those two. That's that's Kabazakistan. No, no, a much better known one. Subazakistan. It's another Stan, but a very the best known Stan. Pakistan. 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 Yes, they play a lot of cricket. They do play cricket there, but they also have this very dangerous sport. So dangerous, it's been banned for all but 15 days of the year. It's a child's pastime that has become aggressive and extreme. Conkers? <laughs> no. It's mentioned and indeed Marvel. sung about in Mary Poppins. Buckaroo? Mary Poppins. Flying a kite. Flying a kite. The idea of extreme kite flying is dangerous. You have to sever your Head? competitors. <laughs> You have to sever your competitor's kite from its string, and so the string's actually made of metal with glass, sharp, abrading glass, and motorcycles get garroted, because hundreds of people do it all over the country. Who told you this, Stephen? This is not... <laughs> this doesn't happen. Being afraid it does. No, I saw it, Channel 5, when kiters go bad. <laughs> <laughs> they shout, Bo Catter, kite down. What about when they garrot someone? What do they shout then? I... Oops. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> It's the Spring Festival of Vasant Panchami, or Basant is when it happens. Uh, there's uh, people against it, the Kite Flying Effectees Committee. People who are affected by kite flying have tried to ban it completely. Do all the kites have to have the face of Des Lynam on them? <laughs> <laughs> he is a god in Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> How big can the kite be? What's the heaviest kite? Huge. Kite? They could weigh anything up to four tonnes. <laughs> Well, <laughs> the largest kite ever made is, weighs nearly a tonne. Um, it's hundred metres 48 long. foot by 36 foot. That's and right. how many people does it take to fly that, then? 50. 50, 50 people, people, yeah. 50 men, says here. <laughs> <laughs> 50 men or 25 fat birds. <laughs> <laughs> it has 200 strings. And the smallest is 1.25 inches across. You can get them in the uh, market and stuff. You see those blokes selling those tiny kites? Have you seen them? No. Yeah. Miniature kites. That's right. On uh, bridges and things or something. How do they? <laughs> How do you, you start using an electric fan? One of those little handheld electric fans that just flies up. Yeah. An invisible string, which makes it very pleasing. It's then so you go fine. and cry. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell am I doing in my life? <laughs> I want to be a doctor. <laughs> 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 Ah, oh, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> so, name the world's most dangerous manager. It's uh, not Dave the Decapitator, who's head of Psychos R Us in Catford. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not Chernobyl Health and Safety or something, is it? <laughs> no, that would count. Is it something like Evil Knievel's manager? Very like Evil Knievel's manager, only go back in time to the Niagara Falls. Blondin's manager. Absolutely right! I think you should get ten points for that. Blondin's manager. <laughs> and for the boys and girls, tell us who Blondin was. Uh, he was a famous he's a tightrope walker. He was the most famous tightrope walker of his day. But he also carried his manager across, which was a disaster, um, because his manager was a lot heavier than him, and Blondin liked slippery tights. And uh, they had to stop six times because he was so heavy. It was on the 17th of August, 1859, and it took 42 minutes. Is that to... his manager then, or just some bloke that wanted to get to the other side? <laughs> <laughs> he'd, he'd take eggs and a frying pan and a trivet and matches, and he'd stop halfway across and uh, make an omelette and then eat it. <laughs> or he'd take a, a lion and a wheelbarrow across with him. Lion. Yeah. A lion? Yeah. <laughs> 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 what was his manager giving him? <laughs> Did he eventually die by falling off one? No, he died, actually, he died in... Uh... Tea cosy. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought I thought it said that he died in a bed of diabetes. No, he died in bed of diabetes. <laughs> Not in a bed, it's one of the restaurant menus, nestling in a bed of diabetes. <laughs> um, no, he died in bed, age 73. Because actually they have terrible trouble, don't they, stopping people trying to go over the Niagara yeah. Falls because people are always trying to get in a barrel and <laughs> I've no yeah. idea why, but they have to have special security yeah. men because apparently there's endless kind of trucks reversing up with sort of concealed... <laughs> 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 and things are going, obviously... right, push me, Dave, I'm f***ing <laughs> going. <laughs> people that want to do that, for them to have to really... They, have, they do know. stop it. There have been 16 known barrel drops, and six of those have ended in mortality. The first of it was a woman. Hey. Yes, Annie, Annie Taylor. She didn't want to. 
that's a honeymoon that's gone horribly wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, Annie Taylor was the first to do it, and she was something of a heroine for doing it. She was, there she is, look. Well, battle actually looks, I mean, God. But um, there's her barrel she's all right. with her name on it. Annie Edson Taylor, heroine of Niagara Falls, it says. And Bobby Leach was the second man to do it. The third man to do it was a Briton, Charles Stevens, and he did it with his legs tied to an anvil. To, uh, <laughs> by this time, people were already bored with the feet by yeah. two people having done it. I think it's really nice they went to all the effort of writing their names on Isn't the barrels. It? Well, he couldn't because he tied it to an anvil in that rather sort of roadrunnery way, you know. <laughs> kind of thing. And all they found of him was a severed arm inside the barrel. <laughs> with a tattoo on it saying, forget me not, Annie. Um, people were obsessed with the Niagara Falls. They had this pirate ship and they filled it with animals, bears and geese and all kinds of things, and sailed it off the top of Niagara. And only two geese survived. Two bears yeah. crawled out and they were shot. <laughs> So, now, what's the most dangerous sporting activity for women? Foxy boxing. Foxy boxing. Foxy boxing. <laughs> Cheerleading somewhere like Iraq would be tough, wouldn't it? You know, it's very I'm going to country. give you... Cheerleading uh, would be quite... I'm going to give you the money. Eh? The points. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Stephen, I really want the car. I know it's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get the points, because the answer is simply cheerleading. Really? Cheerleading is the most dangerous. More injuries well, and that's... deaths are sustained by women yeah, engaged in cheerleading than any other sporting activity. <laughs> the best-known cheerleader in America is... Fancy George Reagan. Bush. George Bush is the right answer. George... Did, did you actually know that? Yes, well, he did it. Yes, thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was, it was the only sporting activity. It's what he did. He didn't, he didn't play sports. Absolutely right. He had special T-shirts made with Go Nads, which was the name of his team. Go Nads. <laughs> you see? I've never seen cheerleaders that aren't in a shower. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's what they did. Yeah. I thought they were just obsessed by lather. <laughs> Other dangerous sports? Bungee jumping, do you anything about that? You can get a detached breast tissue. <laughs> what, at the gift shop afterwards? Or... <laughs> because if you go in, in the nude, they let you do it for free. And Where? Back... Everywhere? Or at a particular site you know of? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you can, if you don't have proper support, your breasts, because mm. of the gravitational pull, <sighs> can fly clean off. <laughs> And you can also get detached retina. And if you shout at a breast that's just been decapitated, as it were, does it still respond for the next 30 seconds? <laughs> it, will, it will still lactate for half an hour. Still it's express itself, quite literally. Um, I like to start. think of... Um, can I go and have a light out? <laughs> well, I like to think Highly of bungee jumping as suicide for indecisive people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tester, isn't it? It is. <laughs> oh, no, I'll be all right with this, yeah. <laughs> I heard a brilliant story about, you know, the Darwin Awards. Obviously, every year they have these Darwin Awards for people taking themselves out of the gene pool. And there was a brilliant story of a guy that, um, he, he was, you know, drunk one night and he decided, right, what I'm going to do is bungee jump. His mates went, you won't be able to. He went, I will. Just got a tow rope and jumped off a bridge. <laughs> obviously, obviously that foot just snapped off and he landed in a freezing river. With no feet. You can swim. <laughs> So, take me back, because it's a good letter D um, for Darwin. I don't know the Darwin Awards. When you say take Darwin, yourself out of the gene pool... Well, it's stories from around the world of people that have killed themselves in such stupid oh, ways. killed themselves, right. There's another brilliant one of a guy that was sitting in his back garden and he had got a couple of balloons and filled them up with, with helium or whatever so that he would float. He thought it would be brilliant if I could float and, and drink beer. Wouldn't that be lovely? It'd be, it'd be so comfy in a garden chair. He went about a mile up and froze to death. <laughs> What an ass! <laughs> but I see what you mean. It's taking out of the gene pool, in other words, uh, the human gene pool does not need those kind of people to pass on their genes to the next generation. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. It's the reason why they should allow people to walk down to railway tracks, if they so wish. <laughs> you, know what? you don't need it. <laughs> if they can't work out a train's coming... <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's face it, the gene pool needs a little chlorine. It... <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> who invented bungee jumping and when? That was the New Zealanders, wasn't it? It was actually a British invention in The bungee strap is a British invention. Yeah. Hurrah. Yeah, we're good on And they never, ever, ever break. 
That, no. must, be, that must be a real comfort to the families of the people that the rope was too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the rope, if you want, it's still perfect. <laughs> I can have another go with the coffee. <laughs> oh, in the grave. Out of the grave. Out of the grave. Oh, it must happen. <laughs> I want that to happen. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm redrafting my will tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've sorted out all our funeral requirements. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, another dangerous sport is Russian roulette, of course. That's dangerous. Yes. In that's... the early days, you had a musket. You'd only, you'd only have the one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a man's game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's six to one. <laughs> six, 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 six. <laughs> What we do know is that in 2005, more than 200,000 cheerleaders had to attend medical facilities with cheerleading-related injuries. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, how could it not be, for us to dare to dip into the deep end of the pool of half-dissolved truths and sheer undiluted mythery that we call general ignorance, so fingers on buzzers, please. What causes deep vein thrombosis on aeroplanes? Oh, you're in first. Sitting still phrases and getting the blood clocked. Ooh! <laughs> Sitting down for too long. Oh, hello. Is it the five pasties you had before you set off? <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out, according to a Lancet article, that if you put people in exactly the same conditions as on a cramped aeroplane, but on dry land in an ordinary room, they don't get the increased chances of DVT. Oh. That it's actually the poor air quality. And you know the air quality on planes is worse now that they've stopped you smoking. I know, exactly right. It's very bad air indeed up there, and they save a lot of money on it being bad air. And it also seems to be a contributory factor to DVT. But there are these compression socks, there was nothing in the newspaper very recently about them actually working. They're hugely sexually attractive, those. <laughs> <laughs> well, they stopped calling them surgical stockings because that sounds so kind of Les Dawson old lady. Uh, and they now call them compression socks. So well, I, think quite, th I like those socks, because if you, you put them on... You would do, because yeah. you're sort of quite pervy, aren't you? <laughs> well, here's the thing I like about them. It's a really tight sock, and when you take it off, it's lovely and itchy. It's, just, it's very satisfying somehow. Do you have bald chins? Do you, I have bald chins? Are you old chins? enough now to have bald chins The lower shin? I don't know what you've been up to, Stephen, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I can't right. even conceive of how you've got As that. men age, the, the hair stops growing on the lower part of the shin. Does it? You must oh, have no, noticed Oh, no, I've that. got virtual quiffs down there. <laughs> have you? You're still pretty hairy right, down there. That. Yeah. <laughs> Crossed by the tip of your penis as well, I can see that. <laughs> Most impressive. I've got to get that reattached. <laughs> With women, it's the other way around. My bikini lines wound around the ankles at the moment. <laughs> so, fingers again on buzzers. How much sleep should you have every night? Vehicles reversing. Go back. Four hours. Good answer. Four hours? Four to seven hours, uh, you'll live a lot longer than if you have eight hours every night. People who have eight hours or more live shorter lives. Yeah, but if you only sleep four hours a night, it can lead to dismantling the welfare state. <laughs> 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 Margaret Thatcher is a famous example, which very well put, of someone who didn't get that much sleep. Yeah, no wonder, really, what she did to the miners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> The average Briton gets six or seven hours sleep a night, as opposed to their grandparents or great-grandparents in 1900, where nine hours a night was the average. Certainly Maybe. people lived less long for all kinds of reasons. What scale do seismologists use to, to measure earthquakes? Sure. The um, Richter scale. Oh! No. No, they don't. <laughs> Seismologists don't, journalists often do still these days, but not for, not for 30 years nearly. They use something else. It's called the MMS, the Moment Magnitude Scale. Are you sure? Absolutely yeah. sure. Yes. You're yes. Sure. I got that wrong. <laughs> you did, but you kindly went into it. There's an example of what happens after an earthquake. The angles, it's rather like Renaissance Mannerist art. The, the diagonals are very... <laughs> the composition is excellent. Happy yeah. Renaissance Mannerist art, don't do, you? Do you? Yeah, it's crap. <laughs> Michelangelo, for example? No? Michelangelo. Don't like him? Bollocks. No. Oh. <laughs> he was particularly good at bollocks, it must be said. It's one thing he absolutely thrived. Has he been spotted in Heat magazine? <laughs> Michelangelo spotted buying pants in Primark. Primark? Primark. Primark. <laughs> Do you get yours made specially by the Queen's tailor? <laughs> I thought you'd had yours done on a loom by exquisite boys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Just to stop. We're making Stephen's pants. Oh. <laughs> I can't wear these. He's got a mole on his face. <laughs> Oh, God, help. Um, <laughs> where and when was the largest earthquake in the United States of America? Oh. Uh, there, on the left. <laughs> the big long one, where everyone lives. The long one. <laughs> you mean San Francisco, 1906? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're a true gentleman. <laughs> it was not the largest. It was certainly perhaps the most catastrophic. It killed... Uh, 3,000 people. Now, you say it killed 3,000 people. A rather disturbing fact about it is it killed 3,000 white people. They didn't count the Chinese dead. Isn't that horrible? A quarter of a million made homeless. But the major cause of death and destruction was not the actual... Fires. It was the fires. Aging of fires. And why did a lot of the fires come about, do you think? A flame. <laughs> Thank you very much. Was it because they were from really building to building? fed up, so they all got pissed and mm. fell asleep? <laughs> No. Gas. Because they weren't Gas. insured against earthquake, but they were insured against fire. So a lot of people started setting fire to their houses <laughs> when they, they saw that they were they... cracked. When the insurance company would go, oh, what are the chances? It burned down the same day, did it? Oh. <laughs> some, you my surprise. some genuine fires were caused by the fact that there was a gas main and that would go up. You know, it was at a time when there was gas lighting and heating all over the city. I think I might know where the largest earthquake was. Yes, same. I think it might be Yellowstone National Park because there's a supervolcano underneath it. Well, you see, you're probably right. I would have to add the right of the question, since European settlement. There may well have been a huge whoa, one in Yellowstone. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's a bit late for that, Stephen. A bit late for oh, that. you wouldn't have said 1906 if I hadn't said since European settlement. <laughs> no. Just on the subject of San Francisco fire, this, this is an example of how nasty. When the fire caught the Windsor Hotel at Fifth and Market Streets, there were three men on the roof and it was impossible to get them down. Rather than see the crazed men fall in with the roof and be roasted alive, the military officer decided uh, to direct his men to shoot them, which they did in the presence of 5,000 people. And there was another man who started the burning... The entertainment back then was yeah. rubbish. <laughs> Another man screamed and begged to be killed as his feet began to burn and he was up on a roof then. And uh, the policeman took his name and address and then shot him through the head. <laughs> took his name and address. <laughs> this is my house. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, actually, the, the greatest earthquake, uh, certainly since European settlement, was that in New Madrid, Missouri, in the Mississippi Valley, during 1811 and 1812. Or you may prefer the one in Prince William Sound, uh, in Alaska in 1964. Either way, the more famous San Francisco earthquake was just simply not in the same class. I think it brings us really <laughs> handily to the end of the quiz on this particular occasion. And looking at the scores, there's astounding, astounding things going on because way out in first place with seven, <laughs> Joe Brand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> in second place with a very handy four points, Sean Locke. Thank you. Neither up nor down, but in third position with zero points, it is Jimmy. <laughs> Which means our runaway fourth place goes to the minus no 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 nineteen of Alan da da da, -da Davis. <laughs> oh. My thanks to Jimmy, Sean, Joe and Alan. I'll leave you with the observation of former Prime Minister David Lloyd George. The most dangerous thing in the world, he said, only in a Welsh accent, is to, uh, <laughs> to try to leap a chasm in two jumps. So from all of us, <laughs> AccuEye, good night. Welcome to QI for another reckless poke of the screwdriver into the fuse box of the unknown. Joining me in the cupboard under the stairs tonight are the slightly shocking Sean Locke. Thank you. The very current Rich Hall. The positively electromagnetic Joe Brand. And the wiry young shaver socket, Alan Davis! <laughs> Tonight we cast an eclectic light on the subject of electricity. Let's complete the circuit. Sean goes. Ooh. Joe goes. <laughs> Rich goes. Alan goes. <laughs> oh, Alan. Thank you, 
you, Alan. Now, don't forget, each edition in the E series encloses an elephant. Right? The first to spot it by waving your elephant card will win our generous elephant in the room bonus. <laughs> like so. <laughs> Otherwise, simply electrify me with interestingness. Anyway, the atmosphere is already absolutely, um, electric. <laughs> I'll have to do better than that. Now, question one, I think. I'm naked. It's... It's... <laughs> it's pouring with rain. Can you give me a good reason why I should crouch down with my bottom in the air? <laughs> Joe. Stephen, I wouldn't have thought you'd need a good reason. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I don't think you need a good reason, because I don't think anybody's even going to approach you to ask you what you're doing. <laughs> it's a clear signal you want some time alone. I'm just picturing that image. Yes. It's one of the most erotic I've ever... It's... I think you'd make a great Athena poster. <laughs> Your buttocks in the rain dripping uh, on bedroom walls up and down the country. <laughs> I think it's because your bottom is the least likely part of you to be struck by lightning. You're sort of in the right, I'm right going area. The, I'm going yeah. with the electric thing. Yeah, absolutely right. It is to do with lightning. Apparently, it's a very good stance to adopt if you're caught in a lightning storm. Or can help. you just drop your trousers and moon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like lightning, everyone! <laughs> <laughs> what should you not do? Go and uh, climb to the top of a pylon or something like that. <laughs> Hold a 40-foot metal pole. <laughs> hey, come on! <laughs> Don't put on a metal hat in the golf course. Don't stand under a tree. What is the problem with being under a tree? Why, why is that bad? Because they are more likely to be struck by lightning. And okay. what happens when they are? There's a big flash, a lot of flame. <laughs> all, all the squirrels um, fall on your head. Not <laughs> You know, you might get burned. Yeah, well, the sap boils in an instantaneous way and the tree explodes. You get covered in splinters. The best thing to do would be to get into a car. Really? Yeah. And drive away from the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Just close the door and stay in the car. It acts as what's called a Faraday cage. It bars, if you like, electromagnetic fields. It's actually 30 million volts you can get in a bolt of light. Why can't we harness that power, Stephen? <laughs> well... <laughs> Do you think you're more likely to be struck if you're a man or a woman? Man. Well, men are out and about a lot more, aren't they? <laughs> you are actually six times more likely to be struck if you're a man. The man always has to hold the <laughs> umbrella, because if the woman holds the umbrella, it keeps jabbing the man in the arm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he's more likely to be struck. Is it because <laughs> women wear more rubber than men? <laughs> Conducts yeah. through them because a lot of women wear rubber pants. Do they now? Did you not know that? No, no, not really my area. The 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 <laughs> wire. Do you have wire in bras? Do you? I mean, does one? You do if you have massive knockers that are in danger of injuring people. Right, and, and they do need. Do you fall into that category? <laughs> You're well, doing badly, I would say. You're very. Thank you. Yes, a lot. Fulsome of... pair of fun bags there. <laughs> But, um, Do you know what? That was almost heterosexual. <laughs> yeah. I may be but on the turn. Wasn't, no, wasn't. no, not. <laughs> um, no. I'd like to hear you whisper that when you're bent over naked in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> A fulsome pair of fun days, actually. <laughs> people around you are getting struck by lightning. <laughs> 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 the, the, the wire won't attract the lightning, but it will superheat when you're struck. You so can your burn yourself. So your blow up? Yeah. <laughs> How exciting. I'm going to have a go. Yeah. <laughs> There's an actor I work with, and he was once walking along the street, and a manhole cover right next to him got struck by lightning, and it flew up in the air, landed on his head. <laughs> um, Instead of being hit by a manhole, he should have been showing his manhole to the lightning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh -huh. so, but the quite interesting thing is, how often does lightning strike the Earth on an average day? Four. Four. So we've got four. I can say that it's more than four. <laughs> Anybody would like to... Is it five? How could you...? <laughs> <laughs> it's 17 million times a day. No No. Way. It means about 200 times a second. Why can't we harness that power? What? <laughs> <laughs> we, perhaps we should. 
How many people in Britain do you imagine are killed each year by lightning strikes? Tw Twelve. No. Thirty. Two. It's between three and six, actually. It's not very many. Four or five. <laughs> yes. Four or five would do it. In America? Probably a lot more because yeah. uh, there's more of us. 400 Americans a year die of it, and uh, about a thousand are injured. There was one American, seven times he was struck. Uh, he, he was a park ranger at the Shenandoah National Park. I know that guy. <laughs> well, he did die in 1983. I knew him in, in 1982, the last time he got hit. <laughs> Do you know how he died? He was very testy. <laughs> <laughs> very irritable. His name was Roy Sullivan. He actually... Uh, That's he not got... what they called him, though. No. They called him Bernie. <laughs> he shot himself in 1983. Oh, he should have just crouched down with his manhole in the air. <laughs> exactly. The point is, if you're caught in an electrical storm, you don't want to shelter under a tree. The best thing to do is to get into your car. But failing that, crouch down into a ball with your head down to your knees and uh, hands clasped behind your head. Now, I have a conundrum for you. Can horses catch eels? <laughs> it's a rather attractive horse, actually, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's a very beautiful horse, yes. Not you a bad looking eel, either. Like the eel. I like the eel. <laughs> There's more you can do with the eel, possibly, but the, mm. um, the horse oh. is... Oh. Oh. It's very hard to get a horse down your pants. Oh! <laughs> no, it genuinely is a very attractive horse. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Nice hair. I bet he's a wanker, that horse. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he runs around again, look at me. <laughs> But anyway, can horses catch eels? That's the I, question. I think they can. And how would they go about it? A net. <laughs> <laughs> there was this German who observed in South America the way humans used horses to catch eels. Very particular kind of eel. Well, was it an electric eel? It was, because that's our theme yes. of the day. It was an electric eel. How would you use a horse? Why can't you catch an electric like eel in the Hold out a fork with a bit of bread on it and try and get the eels to toast it with their <laughs> <laughs> You'd have well, to be on horseback because otherwise you'd get electrocuted, something like that. Well, the problem with catching an electric eel is that, yes, you would get a very nasty shock, 650 volts in a... In a... Put you right off it. So I'm afraid the horses were sent into the water where the electric eels would go crazy and discharge all their electricity until their batteries were flat and then they could be safely harvested. And the poor horses, of course often had heart attacks and died of fright or drowned and got very upset, so it was rather mean. Got very upset? Yes. <laughs> Distressed is the word we use of animals. Yeah. I don't like it in the water, the eels! <laughs> Ow! <laughs> I wouldn't do it to that nice pretty one, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> You like the tousled hair look? I, there are I boys think... all over England doing themselves in your style now. <laughs> We're going to send you horsey photos. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, <laughs> half of an electric eel's whole physiology is devoted to creating electricity. So they've got quite a powerful kick, but once it's used up, they're, then they're easy to catch. They're not actually eels, oddly enough. They're a sort of knife fish. 69 species there are of electric fish, including the torpedo fish. <laughs> and the torpedo fish comes from the Latin torpore, meaning to numb. It was used as an anaesthetic by the Romans. And from that, the underwater missile was named. Now, here's a big question. In 1903, Thomas Alva Edison released a movie whose title consisted of three words, two of which begin with E. What was it and who started it? I ah. know, we've nearly forgotten them, but oh. here it is. Oh, elephant in the room. <laughs> Well, you are absolutely right. It was actually called Electrocuting an Elephant. He made a film in which an elephant <laughs> was electrocuted. <laughs> Hooray! You win those points. How many points? Ten points. Oh, ten points. <laughs> now, why would Edison want to electrocute an elephant? He wanted elephant? to electrocute the biggest thing he could find to show that he was the best at electrocuting. Well, actually, <laughs> it was the reverse, you see. He believed that his direct current was safe and wouldn't hurt people and didn't electrocute. He wanted to destroy the reputation of alternating current, which was owned by Westinghouse. So he used the word Westinghouse to mean electrocuted. And this elephant, Topsy, was sentenced to death on Coney Island. 
because Topsy had killed three human beings and it was going to be hanged, or was it going to be poisoned, what was going to happen oh, to hanged. Topsy? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's quite a picture, isn't it? <laughs> and... <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Poor Edison. <laughs> So Edison won the right to electrocute him in public to show how dangerous it was. This thing you're letting into your homes will kill an elephant. And he filmed it as, as a PR like film. A, it's like a snuff people. film. A snuff film, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He gave it 460 grams of cyanide and potassium in carrots. He had wooden sandals lined with copper put on her feet. It was a she-elephant. And then a current of 6,600 volts sent through her body. She died without a trumpet or a groan, apparently. And he filmed the event tried to persuade people to refer to electrocution as being Westinghouse. He, he trampled, he trampled, he just went nuts and trampled it. No, no, yeah. he hid in their rooms when they came home, he jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> he got away with it for months. Wearing a Jason <laughs> mask. Nobody would have caught him, you know. Cunning you the tell, sky. Tell, tell, you tell, tell signs around the flat. <laughs> <laughs> big elephant shaped hole in the wall. <laughs> yeah. The first murder on Topsy's hands was killing a trainer who frankly deserved to die because this trainer gave uh, a lit cigarette to eat. <laughs> it killed him? Yeah. <laughs> Quite right, yeah. <laughs> Don't do that again. Yeah. Oh, I like the sound of Topsy. Yeah. Mm, that a bit do you know that some elephants are evolving now that don't have tusks? Did you know that? Because, because the, 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 the ones with tusks get poached. Right, get shot. So the, the ones that with smaller tusks, right, don't yes. get shot. So that gene of the small tusk gene lives on more frequently. And eventually elephants are going, and there's elephants being born now that don't grow tusks. I like that. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and there's, like some, that. there's some tigers now that have been made of Axminster. <laughs> no, stop it. Nice animals, really. Not as sexy as certain horses, but... <laughs> Anyway, let's, let's raise the stakes now with something a little more technical. How fast do the electrons move along an electric wire? They don't. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, they do move. Uh, oh, the, the very words we thought you might use. Really? Yeah. So I, would, I would have said something that... Really fast. It's very, 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 very fast. But also... <laughs> I said I would have said that. I would have said that. I, would, I said I didn't say that. <laughs> I would have said that actually probably like sort of 30, 40 miles an hour, something deceptively slow. I would have said it's a bit of a crap question, really. Why is that? Well, because modern physicists see electrons as something you would call probability density functions. That is an absolutely precise description of what quantum physics does call an electron. And I'm immensely impressed. Well, I have to give you five points for that, if not ten. <laughs> That's astounding. They are exactly that. <laughs> they do call them that. They are dimensionless entities that are quite hard to understand. But they do travel along electrical wires. But the interesting thing is, you're right to say slow. They're actually 0.03 miles per hour. Snail's pace along the wire. But electricity itself is incredibly quick. You have to think of, of waves. If you had a tube full of marbles and you, you pushed a marble in one end, another marble would come out the other end almost instantaneously. But the marbles inside are travelling very, very slowly. It's the wave front that moves very, very fast. And that's how the electrons travel along, literally at a snail's pace, about the same speed as a snail, work each if you one. Get ten snails together if you push the end snail? <laughs> I'll try that in my dressing room later. <laughs> it's, a lovely, it's a lovely experiment and must be done. And now we come on to our experimental round. What is the most interesting thing you can do with the objects on the trays beneath your desks? Oh. <laughs> Tell the boys and girls what you have in I front have of you. I have a lasagna. You have a lasagna. A gherkin, which I'm liable to eat because I'm ravenous. A gherkin. <laughs> I've got a bit of a cable. You can heat it up. You can heat the gherkin. You can heat the lasagna. Now you, you plug, plug it the in. Thing into the thing. Well, yeah. I, I think thing. this is how Alan Sugar started Amstrad. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of his first computers. There you go, thirty quid. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You've you've done the right thing. It's a, it's some kind of uh, gherkins because they're pickled, and then I don't know anything. <laughs> Nothing else. 
was. <laughs> Supreme Jesus. Jesus! But, yes? This is part of Kate Moss's new range at Topshop. So, <laughs> 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 zero. It's... Nothing's happening. No, but the gherkin will behave as a light bulb. If you put a charge through a gherkin, it will glow. The lasagna can provide the power. Because it's salty, and salt is an electrolyte, the two types of metal in the lid and in the pan, as long as they're not touching each other and shorting out, one of our elves experimented over the weekend demonstrating how a gherkin light bulb works, and you can see a lit gherkin. This is one of our elves, just the other day. Wow, isn't that great? It's like kids' TV in the 70s, isn't it? Yeah! <laughs> Where's the lasagna? There we, and then we unplug. Well, the lasagna, unfortunately, you would need a lasagna, perhaps appropriately, the size of the floor plan of the gherkin building. I'm um, having one of those when I get home Which is about tonight. five <laughs> football pitches worth of lasagna. <laughs> Cycling home tonight, I shouldn't put a lasagna on the crossbar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have got lights, officer. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, it's hot. <laughs> These will be in the shops soon. Yep. <laughs> the lasagna pod. <laughs> Um, as far as trying this at home goes, uh, wiring a gherkin to the electric lights, um, don't, obviously. I mean, obviously, be sensible and uh, don't do anything because I tell you to or tell you not to. Um, live your own lives. Mm. <laughs> uh, essentially, try and do that if you yeah. can. Shag horses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now, in an abrupt vault fass, uh, we turn face to face with the ghastly spectre of general ignorance. So, fingers on electrical devices, if you would. What is the difference between a ship and a boat? <laughs> yes, Joe. Has a ship got curtains? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just about the oddest answer I've ever heard. Before. <laughs> Any question? No. I, a ship may have curtains, but so may a boat. Ships are bigger. Oh! <laughs> oh well, and the alley, well, and they are bigger. Ships have lifeboats. Boats don't have lifeboats. They are already a boat. <laughs> well, we're talking navy here. We're talking navy. In the navy, a ship is any vessel which is named. Uh, no. Surface, i.e. ships, frigates, destroyers, anything like that, except little dinghies and lifeboats, which are boats, I grant you. So a boat is a but submarine. A, a, a boat is a submarine. And some submarines are bigger than three frigates put together. So what's the difference? I'm afraid I A boat is to... a submarine. A submarine goes underwater. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Steve. Like well, a... no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> What ship is on like the surface. A rowing boat, is that a ship then? They have them in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, they don't have rowing boats in the Navy, do they? They oh, might no. have oars on a lifeboat, which is a boat, I grant you. But, it, but there's not a vessel of the line. Is it a rowing ship then? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the Navy, yes, it is. It's a rowing ship. So the only boats in the Navy are submarines? All, yes. That's uh, complete bollocks. It's true. <laughs> the only vessels of the line that are called a boat are submarines in the Navy. I'd, I'd, I'd fail to agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you something else. There's not two moons. A ship. <laughs> In German, there's das Schiff and there's das Boot. I don't know which das is which. Das Boot. It's spelled with two O's, but pronounced Boot. But no, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's pronounced Boot. It's not pronounced Boot, yes, unless it you're is. from Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> I was in uh, Germany, watched for the World Cup, and these two lads came up and said, Do you know where Jump House is? <laughs> Jump House. Jump House. Jump House is a. Yeah. Slang term for a brothel term. Yeah, modern joke. <laughs> and as soon as I yeah. said it, I immediately knew it. You knew like, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's something so camp about modern German, though. You know, they. You know what they call a mobile phone? It's just so typical handy. camp. My handy. <laughs> oh, who's my handy? <laughs> my handy for law. Oh, that's my handy. Are you handy? 
you hosting the BAFTAs this year? Uh, you did not know. No? Oh, it's a shame, because I was going to say you should do it in that voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, and welcome to the BAFTAs. <laughs> Stop it! No. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, yes, it's a purely naval tradition. It's no... In true English, you could call it a ship or a boat, and who could say ye nay? But that was the nature of our question, and a foolish one it was. As well as inventing the battery, Alessandro Volta, after whom the Volta is named, also discovered methane. Which animal contributes most methane to the atmosphere? <laughs> yes. Cow. Oh! Oh, oh yes. Ants. No! <laughs> oh, termites. Is the right oh. answer. <laughs> well done. I only, I only know that because I had a swanky showbiz lunch with a producer the other day and he let it slip. <gasps> <laughs> what do I do, ladies and gentlemen? For the honesty, I'm inclined to let of, you what keep sort your. What's the showbiz point? lunch? Do you talk about termite fights? <laughs> Where well, is your career going? <laughs> <laughs> this is my career. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> so I'll just say, I was there and I completely Did ignored it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Methane is a much worse uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. In fact, it's about 23 times worse. They are staggeringly populous. Well, why don't we feed them on something like a clear soup? <laughs> <laughs> broth that hasn't got any sort of, you know, pungent vegetable matter in, just like that. You could never make that many little termite bowls. You, yeah, you... <laughs> How do cows produce methane? What do cows do to get... Farting. They don't fart it, they burp it, oddly enough. Jesus. Cows? So if you went round with a lighter... I mean, they, they went... <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, yes. Maybe that's where the dragon myth came from. Very good. <laughs> they burped a bit of methane, set like one like, Oh, the dragon! <laughs> How did you two end up having a dinner with the producer? <laughs> uh, you weren't invited. You lunch. Were you not invited? No. I wasn't you want to see what I've got? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to termites. Yes. They have suicide bombers. <laughs> termites have suicide bombers huh? who guard the hill, yeah. Um, when predators approach, they explode and produce a sticky mess which glues the place up, prevents ants from attacking them. All righty, now, why do thousands of Americans call the emergency services on Christmas Day? Because they haven't got any friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're lonely and drunk. And, uh, <laughs> so they, get, they get a touch tone phone and go, 911, <laughs> Very good. Is it because they eat so much that their fingers chub up and they get all the... Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's not the reason. What happens on Christmas Day that's particular to that day? Presents in the morning. Presents. So they phone up, they thank the fire brigade for their presents. <laughs> they give things that, you know, <laughs> they hurt themselves with. Or make calls <laughs> with. Suppose somebody gave you a, a mobile phone. I'm handy. I'm handy. For Weihnacht. <laughs> And it was your first mobile phone. And you very excited about it. Say, went have you got up the receipt? Your ass or well, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you phone up the emergency service just to see if it's worked. Because you can't call anybody else up because you haven't got a network yet. All phones in America, whether they've got a SIM card in them or not, have to, by law, be able to call 911, the emergency service. Does that annoy the emergency service? I would service. imagine it drives them crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lastly, We've come to the end of our Quizlet, and we have one more question, and it's on the subject of electricity, our favourite subject. Why wouldn't a Russian family call their son power station or industrialisation? Well, they're not names, are they? Because they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're not names. They're not names. No, they're not they names. They are. They are. They were. Oh, yeah. They are names. <laughs> I'm saying, why wouldn't they call this? Because they're girls' names. Name. Because they're girls' names girls is the right answer. Name. Well done. Well done. Power station is Electrostancia, is a girl's name, and Industrializatia is also a girl's name. But if you had a boy, you could call him Combine, which is Combine Harvester. <laughs> or you could call him Dvadstat Tretje Fevralia, which is the 23rd of February. <laughs>
But this is actually a tradition in the, the Russic area, if you like, in Ukraine. Their names like Noibie Batko, don't kill me, father. Oh. <laughs> Who do you believe? Is it like the, you know, the, the, I don't know, it's a Red Indian thing where they, you come out of the wigwam, the first thing you'd see. Right. So they come out to see a power station. Do well, you know my husband's uh, Native American name is. What? Sits in front of telly farting. <laughs> Imagine if you said it quickly, it sounds quite nice. Yeah. It does. You call him Sitsi. Sitsi Telefarti. Said it in a Russian accent. Yeah, yeah. Sitsi in front of Telefarti. I like your, I like your sort of camp German accent the best. Oh, sure. And yeah, I'd like yeah. you to... Can you just do Handy again for oh, me? What's my Handy? <laughs> Before we close, Stephen, the horse is actually here. What? <laughs> <laughs> now then, well, I don't know you, Archie. I have, I think, reached... <laughs> <laughs> I have reached the end of my fuse, and it's time to look at the scores. With her name in lights... <laughs> with ten it's points is now. Joe Brown! <laughs> in second place, with one point, Rich Hall! In third place, with minus 12 points, it's Sean Locke. Thank you. And finally, with minus 21 points, is Alan Davis. <laughs> so the world teaches electrically discharged. That's goodbye from Rich, Sean, Joe, Alan and me. Good night.